button. Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Reiniger. I'm chair of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, on behalf of all of the members of the Town Council, the Town Manager Matthew Sturgis sitting to my left and the Assistant Town Manager Deborah Lane sitting to my right, I'd like to welcome you to the March Town Council meeting, March 2024. And I'll ask for the, uh, our assistant town manager to call the roll, please. Chairman Reiniger? Here. Councilor Anderson? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Gillis? Here. Councilor Harriman? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Thompson? Here. Mr. Chairman, you do have a quorum. Thank you, Deborah. And now the chair would like to recognize Councilor Anderson to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Next item, Town Council Reports and Correspondence. The chair recognizes Councilor Jordan. How do you know? Jeez, I'm crow. Sure. Um, I'd like to give a, uh, an update on the School Building Advisory Committee, and I'll ask uh, my cohort on that group to fill in the blanks, Tim, if you want to. Um, we've got a lot of... Uh, uh, we made a lot of progress over the last uh, month or so, and um, one of the things that uh, members of the uh, School Building Advisory Committee, as well as uh, um, citizens of town, we had uh, three uh, tours of schools in the area that have um, South Portland, which has a new middle school, Portland, where there was renovations, and, um, and Scarborough's went with school. Um, some were new construction, some were renovation, just to give people an idea of what the opportunities are when you uh, look at renovation for existing structures. Um, we've narrowed from seven to three options. Uh, these options are a combination of new construction with some heavy renovation to Pond Cove. Um, one is a proposal that has a, uh, a new middle school with some renovations to uh, Pond Cove. We'll be looking to um, this Thursday. Um, we'll be diving into these options a bit more as we work with Harriman to, um, uh, to kind of dig deep into what are some um, uh, changes or tweaks that we can do to these uh, proposals. Um, we will be addressing questions around sizing, sequencing costs, return on investments, and how the high school fits in. Um, so the uh, meeting on uh, March 14th should be pretty informative. We also have some other key dates coming up. On 328, that's a Thursday, uh, the School Building Advisory Committee will be receiving um, the options once again with uh, costs associated with them in preparation for a forum, a public forum on April 4th. Um, this should be a really, um, uh, we're looking to have great attendance at this forum uh, so that we can create an understanding of benefits and costs um, and gain uh, input from um, our citizens. Uh, also, um, after, the forum on the 4th, there'll be about a two plus week process where we will reach out to the community in a couple of different ways. We'll have some mini forums um, where we will present to groups in town, et cetera, so people can be a little bit more of an intimate setting. And um, we are looking toward doing a survey. On 5-2, on May 2nd, um, our goal is as a committee to have uh, uh, developed our recommendation. 
um, between, uh, also between the 4th of April and the 2nd of May, we'll be meeting with the uh, town council and school board as we uh, move toward that final recommendation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information out on the website, which is um, capeelizabethsbac.com. You'll be seeing ads in the courier. Um, don't hesitate to send questions, comments, concerns, anything to the uh, SBAC uh, email. Uh, and um, as I stated, we'll be using uh, other mechanisms to get the word out to uh, people as to what's happening with the project. Tim, did you want to add anything? No, I think you covered it very well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Any questions for the Councillor Jordan? Thank you. Any further reports, correspondence? Councillor Anderson. Uh, yes, I'd like to report on the Ordinance Committee. Um, I was uh, hoping that we were done with the pesticide ordinance, but due to some spirited citizen participation at our last meeting, uh, we made some more changes to that ordinance, and it's actually going back uh, or the, to the Ordinance Committee for further language review on the 25th. And I'm hoping that that can come to the Town Council for the April meeting, but who knows. Uh, we did send the floodplain ordinance to this, uh, to the Town Council for approval tonight. Um, another item, at the last Town Council meeting, the Town Council approved um, the Town Manager or his designee um, applying for a grant under the Housing Opportunity Program by the Department of Economic and Community Development. That was approved uh, because the deadline for applying was two days ago. Um, uh, the ninth, I think. But, um, so uh, Maureen and I both attended a webinar on the 13th to learn more about the opportunities under this program. Uh, the grant limits were $50,000 each. There was a number of programs available, and the one that we thought would be best for Cape Elizabeth would be um, the parcel about uh, enabling, uh, uh, setting up uh, toolkits for um, ADUs. And so um, following that webinar, uh, I had a meeting with Ben and Jake and Maureen uh, to discuss the viability of applying for this grant. And long story short, we decided no, uh, it wasn't worth it. Um, however, what did come out of that was the recommendation which appears as item number 58 on tonight's agenda. And so that was a part and parcel of a response to that housing opportunity grant. Uh, what we decided to do instead of setting up an ADU kit with, with pre-approved designs by architects, we would do a page that would have frequently asked questions and some other incentives that we might use to help people along the process. So that is the genesis of item number 58, and that is also the reason why we did not apply for a grant. Just wanted to update the town council on that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Anderson, any questions for Councillor Anderson? Are there any further reports, correspondence from the Council? All right, seeing none, Chair will now recognize Councillor Thompson to give the Finance Committee report. So the way it's listed in our packets, the dashboard comes up first. Uh, did anybody have any, was there any items on the dashboard that uh, had any councillor has a, have a question on what's on the dashboard? I get a question on the dashboard. Yes. It might be, uh, well, the two of you. Um, I think this dashboard was developed back when Jessica Sullivan was on the council. I think she, I think she was the impetus behind making this happen, um, which I think is fantastic. One of the questions I have is, are there... Um, are there additions that we want to put on this dashboard? Um, example being um, Fort Williams parking fees. What 
because we know that we track toward a goal relative to that um, and be a nice thing to see. Um, and this is one that uh, from an expenditures perspective, I wonder if we want to consider for the future uh, Fort Williams expenditures, because those are big things. And I think on this dashboard is all of these uh, key things that uh, in town. And I'm, that's just my opinion, and you guys can talk hmm. about it. The name is Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Councilor Jordan. Uh, great question. We are more than happy to add that. So if there are elements that you'd like us to put in, uh, we can do that. Uh, if we can look at some larger tickets. Uh, we can grow this as, uh, to there, so next month we'll put in the parking revenues, and we can yeah. we can tr we can under expenditures we can put in those accounts that are tracked uh, re relative to Fort Williams Park. So we could have our our labor from the parks side of it, uh, overtime from the park side of it, as well as other elements mm -hmm. that we have for expenditures. So we can we can yeah, those and maybe as maybe as we go through our budget process over the next several weeks or so, we'll identify that this is one that maybe we want in the dashboard, but the one that really popped to mind was the parking fees as a revenue stream. Well, sure, no, we're happy, happy, to, happy to provide any information that you'd like uh, specific. We can, you know, you can track some. I mean, we have, you, you notice here, we have cable franchise fees are on there. That, that stays at, you know, anticipated, anticipated until roughly April slash May when we finally get the check right. from the cable company. So, uh, yeah, we're happy to do that. So thank you for asking. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for Councillor Thompson or Mr. Sturgis on the finance report? All right. Seeing none, we are now ready for our Next item, citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. I will note that we have had quite a bit of activity of emails and social media with respect to two issues tonight. Uh, items right here, nine and 12, so uh, we are carefully studying those. We'll make those part of the record for sure. So this item, of course, is for items not on the agenda. And the chair now recognizes Cynthia Dill as our first speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, esteemed members of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and Assistant Town Manager and Town Manager, my name is Cynthia Dill. I live at 1227 Shore Road. And I'm just here tonight to alert any housing enthusiasts that we are having a site walk uh, to see the 22 acres of land that have been identified by Sebago Technics as being feasible for potential development of affordable housing at Gullcrest. We've had one before and it was uh, well attended. Saturday, mark your calendar, Saturday, March 23rd, 2024 at 9 a.m. We're going to meet at the um, Greenbelt Trailhead on Starbird Drive. As some of you may know, Starboard Drive has an entrance on um, Spurwink Ave as well as Scott Dyer. And right at the elbow of Starboard Drive in the Cape Colonial Village is an entrance to the Greenbelt Trail that takes you right to the footbridge into the Gullcrest parcel right where the 22 acres of land is. And so everyone is welcome. Um, Saturday, March 23rd at 9 a.m., uh, wear sturdy shoes that can get muddy. Uh, we'll hike for approximately one and a half miles on moderate terrain. And just a reminder that up to 196 homes for families, kids, and seniors and our workforce can potentially be built without changing the law. It's one locally grown solution to advance the goals of the comprehensive plan that is fiscally conservative and socially responsible and I continue to work on it and my goal is to have a non-binding referendum question in November. So if you're interested in seeing this land that has been identified identified as potentially feasible to develop affordable housing, please join us on Saturday, March 23rd at 9 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dill. The chair will now recognize John Volz. Thank you. John Volz, 33 Phillip Road. So this is uh, something I've raised before, and I'm back here again to say I'm here in the spirit so that our town can function as well as it possibly can. And I've been an advocate 
so that you all have the best data that you can to make the best decisions. And when I look through the town goals, I see we still have a long-term capital plan as one of the goals, but we do not have a long-term capital plan. And that's a problem. We are now at another budget year. The long-term capital plan is your map from where you're going, where you've been and where you're going. And here we are in another budget year that says, here's what we're doing. But we can't measure that against any map of where we are in any longer term view. And that's a challenge because you don't have the information you need to evaluate the budget in a, against a long term plan. And here's why that's a concern. When you have Joe Katera come in and talk about bonding, he mentions a couple of things like ratios that are important. And we're below a couple of minimum ratios like debt expense to total expense and <clears throat> valuation to, to outstanding debt. And the reason they set those minimums and their minimum numbers for rating is that they're trying to ensure if you're consistently below those minimums, you're not in a position where you're maintaining your infrastructure, or at least you're certainly at risk of that. You may be, but you need to make sure that you are. And we have been consistently below those. And that's why what you do in the past affects what you're going to do in the future and what you're going to have to spend. Someone who routinely changes the oil in their car is going to have a different repair profile than someone who says, I'm not going to spend a dime on oil changes. I'm just going to save my money and wait till something breaks. What you've done in the past affects what you do in the future. You can see that in a long-term plan. You can see where you're going. And here we are. It's another budget year, and we don't have a long-term capital plan to measure it against. So I hope that it's coming soon before you have to approve the budget so that you can measure where you are on the map and so that the public can all see where we're headed. It's not just we all want to see. We all want to know. We all want to understand that we're replacing our assets at a reasonable rate. Thank you, Mr. Volz. Is there anyone in the room who would like to speak? All right, the chair will now recognize, well, Ms. Tennyson, would you like to speak? I guess I don't, I don't have if you're attending. Chair. Okay. No, it was just, uh, just, uh, she just happens to populate that corner of the okay. screen, but you're okay. No hands up on the online version. There is some. No, there is not. There are none. All right. That concludes the public comment period. Next, we'll have the town manager, Mr. Sturgis, will give his monthly report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I'll be brief this evening because I, uh, I have a larger or a longer uh, moment of speaking later in the agenda this evening. Uh, a couple different things I'd like to circle back on. Uh, we were anticipating a presentation this month, uh, but due to an illness, a gentleman had a, uh, uh, one of our presenters had an illness, so we're looking to have him come next month. Uh, and this is relating to the email that you received uh, a week and a half to two weeks ago regarding cell coverage in the northern part of town and the challenges of, of trying to, uh, to actually make a, a call from the, in that section of town. Uh, so we have a gentleman from uh, Tilson as well as representatives from Verizon to come uh, to talk about uh, a, a project that they'd like to present to the town that could improve cell coverage in that area of Cape Elizabeth. So just a, a preview of coming events uh, when it comes to that. Uh, so we anticipate that for April, and that was confirmed last week. Uh, secondly, uh, to Mr. Volz's point, I think it's a great point. We have been working on that uh, for quite a while now. Uh, as you notice this year in our, in our, on our CIP uh, segment of the budget, we have, it, it grew significantly because we've had work done uh, evaluating all of the municipal facilities and, uh, and put on a priority list as well as a timeline as to those repairs that need to take place uh, with with those buildings and how to how to plan those as well as <clears throat> excuse me from the public works side which is one of our other larger uh, capital intense uh, departments as well as on the PD side so we've tried to integrate all of that but we're also pulling together into that evaluation uh, the uh, information from the schools who recently also had a facility study but also the large ticket item is is what Councillor Thompson Councillor Jordan and I have been spending our Thursdays on 
fairly regularly with the school building advisory committee. Uh, so that, that's part of the equation. But we are looking to have that uh, information all pulled together as well as uh, uh, items for fiscal policy, such as uh, uh, different policies that we've already established, but we want to pull them all together into one document for the council to have as, as we go forward. So uh, it is still a work in progress, but uh, we do agree with Mr. Volz as we try to move this forward and try to deliver a package to the council that they find useful. Thank you, Mr. Sturgis. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the town manager? Council Anderson. Can I make a request? Can I, can I make a request? Oh, there's a technical yeah. problem here. Who can help with this? Can I make a request that whoever sets up technology make sure all the speakers work? Because we've got people over 40 up here. We shall endeavor to persevere, uh, <laughs> Councillor Jordan. We will work on that. I apologize for the, the technical uh, challenge. No, that, I don't know what's up with those speakers. Yeah. So, are you? The speakers are plugged into the thing. Are we not we're hearing yeah. as well as we can hear you as well, or is there a disability? We'll make sure everybody speaks into their microphone. Oh, okay. I will make sure I do not mumble this evening. <laughs> Councillor Jordan. <laughs> All right. I don't know, is there anyone here who can attend to this a little bit more or is it I don't know. If it's I think we I think we may have to really speak in the mics uh, this evening. I apologize for the, the tech okay. item. All right. All right, next item is review of the draft minutes of the February 12, 2024 Town Council meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Councilor Anderson, is there a second? I'll second. Councilor Gillis, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the minutes? Any opposed? Okay, that carries, thank you. Now we have presentation on the town center intersection improvements and the update there too. So, Mr. Sturgis, do you want to lead it or turn it over to? Uh... Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the we we all appreciate the opportunity to come here this evening to present on the town center infra, um, infrastructure improvements and safety improvements that we've been working on for. Uh, started in 2020 and Jay's uh, working to set up and get his computer to present so uh, he'll do the introduction as to what we've been uh, the, the intro part of the project and then uh, he'll transition over to myself to talk about the financing and uh, the way that we anticipate to fund this project and then uh, thirdly we'll, we'll transition to Steve Harding and Nikki Conant from Sebago uh, Engineering, uh, Sebago Technics Engineering to provide the technical aspects and the work that we've done. And Jay will also talk about outreach that's taken place with the abutting property owners and the work that uh, the overall town has been working on. So Jay, how you doing? Ready to go. Okay. Thank you, sir. I just want to thank, thank you and thank the town council for the opportunity this evening to uh, provide an update with regards to our progress on the town center intersection project. So uh, as Matt introed, um, I'm Jay Reynolds, the public works director. We have uh, Steve Harding, our town engineer from Sebago Technics here, along with Nikki Conant, who is our design engineer also from Sebago Technics. And uh, Matt rounds out the project management team as far as uh, our work together, getting things uh, moving and uh, in the planning stages for this project. So tonight, uh, here's the agenda just to go over briefly and we'll move along pretty quick. I uh, wanna cover the project history a little bit and give the council an update on some public outreach we've been doing. Uh, we'll hand it over to Sebago Technics to talk about the proposed um, changes or upgrades to the intersection uh, to date. And we'll also cover next steps uh, moving forward through the course of the year and into next year. And then uh, also give the town council an opportunity to ask any questions and provide any input you wish. So that's a brief rundown of the agenda. So moving <clears throat> into project history, uh, this intersection's had a long history of uh, safety concerns, and it's been studied uh, many years 
in the past. Uh, most recently in 2020, uh, we hired uh, T.Y. Lin to perform a traffic study at this location. And in their, uh, in their study, they referenced several other studies that date back to 2008, 2003, and as far back as 1990. Um, so the safety issues at this intersection have been uh, long-standing here. Uh, but mo going back to the 2020 report, um, there were several recommendations that were provided by T.Y. Lin. In those recommendations, uh, Tom Errico, the traffic engineer, provided a uh, workshop presentation to the town council in 2021. And uh, shortly thereafter, the town council uh, decided in their annual review of their goals uh, to include uh, this intersection um, in their goals as uh, to continue to look at uh, providing safety improvements at this location. So it's been in the goals uh, for the town councils uh, for the last three years. Moving ahead to FY24, uh, town st staff approached the council for funding for engineering services uh, to further the design from the 2020 report. And we have uh, secured those through the current FY24 CIP budget and are working with Sebago Technics uh, to work through the design phase. So that's a quick rundown as uh, to where we've been and, and where we're going. Um, with regards to, oh, I don't wanna go ahead yet, let's see. Um, this location has been identified as what's called a high crash location. So what that means is the main Department of Transportation, they review all traffic intersections throughout the state. And when there's a certain level of uh, motor vehicle crashes, pedestrian crashes, bicycle crashes, uh, within a three year period, um, if it reaches a certain threshold, they consider it uh, what's called a high crash location. Uh, which is not a good designation for intersections and safety. Uh, so the 2020 report confirmed that um, through its analysis that it is a high crash location. Uh, so a lot of the uh, improvements that you'll see um, that Nikki will show us in a few minutes uh, aims to address a lot of the safety issues at this location. With regards to outreach, uh, at the end of January, sent out a letter to the immediate abutters at this location at the intersection. And uh, the, the purpose of that was threefold, really, to give them uh, a notice that we are working on this uh, location. And it was an opportunity to um, outline the design uh, to date and show them uh, progress on our uh, plans for the intersection. And also uh, to give them an opportunity to provide feedback and comments um, those have been uh, fairly well received. We've gotten great feedback from the businesses and residences in the immediate area. Uh, most are pleased that we're moving forward um, with these improvements. So that's kind of the general theme from some of the meetings that I've had um, with those, those property owners. Uh, so that's a quick rundown. I think from here I'll hand it over to Nikki and um, she can go over some of the more finer details of the design. And go from there. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, Council, for um, hearing us out this evening. As Jay noted, um, we have been retained, Sebago Technics has been retained to take basically the recommended improvements from the TU Island study and bring them through the design phase. So I want to walk you all through a little bit of what we've done thus far. So just to kind of um, lay out what this plan is that you're seeing in front of you, um, there is a legend up in the upper left. I realize it's probably a little tough to see up on the screen, um, but these kind of dark blue lines represent new curb lines. Uh, the gray shading represents new concrete sidewalk. Uh, the green space is basically um, existing pavement that's being rehabbed into potential esplanade space that could be treated for lighting accommodations, um, landscape accommodations, and things of that nature. Um, there's a dark red line on here that represents the existing right-of-way, and then there's different types of shadings on the roadway as well that represent um, paving. So the 
recommendation from the TU Island report was to ultimately try to square up these intersections to provide more separation between them. Uh, some of the benefits of squaring up the intersections is allowing a vehicle to pull up more at a 90 degree angle to the intersection and hopefully provide some better sight lines um, between the intersections and also to pedestrians as well. Um, as I know you all are very well aware, when people pull up to these intersections, you're kind of at a skew, which creates a challenge um, making proper sight lines with both oncoming vehicles as well as pedestrians. So the improvement that you see here um, actually increases the separation center line to center line between the two intersections to about 140 feet of separation. The other thing that we had to take into account when we're setting the new radii for the intersection, so basically the, the curves as they come into uh, Ocean House Road is what's the design vehicle look like? So what size truck do we have to accommodate um, making turning movements through the intersections? So this configuration right now um, allows both a fire truck and a bus to properly uh, make the important movements off Shore Road and off Scott Dyer Road to Route 77. Some of the big benefits of this layout are the improvements to the crosswalks specifically across both Shore Road and Scott Dyer Road. Uh, the existing crosswalk lengths are incredibly long today, so by being able to square up these intersections, we're able to shorten those crosswalk lengths. Um, Scott Dyer Road, for example, goes from 124 feet of crossing length for a pedestrian to about 65 feet, and Shore Road goes from about 126 feet to about 75 feet. So a pretty sizable reduction um, by separating the intersections and squaring them up a little better. And as a part of that, um, that removes the existing raised medians that are in the roadway and really kind of tightens everything up. The layout you see here also on um, Ocean House Road accommodates 11-foot travel lanes as well as 5-foot shoulders. 5-foot um, shoulders is consistent with what we have traditionally been doing on the town center with some of our other sidewalk projects. Um, it is sized such that a bike uh, can utilize the shoulder as kind of a, a bike lane without necessarily the stenciling. Um, we've also proposed two crosswalk locations, one in the existing location across Ocean House Road and a secondary one um, in the vicinity of the Cumberland Farms. Um, there's a significant amount of pedestrians that cross there today without a crosswalk. And so we would be proposing crosswalks at both locations with um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. So basically those um, light up signs that when pushed by a pedestrian give additional visibility and alert to um, vehicular traffic that there's someone in the crosswalk. Additionally, there's pretty wide lanes out there today. And so the um, bringing in the curb lines and um, allowing for the 11 foot travel lanes and the five foot shoulders is kind of giving a bit of a road diet through the intersections and hopefully we'll provide a bit of traffic calming through there. Uh, another big piece that um, Jay has kind of been handling through his public outreach is to accomplish the separation and the curb lines where they need to go requires uh, the closure of Holman Road. And so you'll see, oh, you can't see my mouse, unfortunately. Um, but that's why you'll see basically green space, sidewalk, and curb in front of Holman Road. Um, so the intent would to be for most of those properties that access Holman Road, they either have a secondary access to Ocean House Road or we would provide a rerouted alternative further away from the intersection just to remove those additional vehicular conflicts. Other than that, I think the, that's kind of the highlight. I want to um, open this up for questions and comments at the end, but I will pass this over to Town Manager Sturgis to kind of wrap up budgeting and next steps. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, great job there. Can I ask can a sure. clarification? There's only, uh, we, we address the entrance exit for Cumberland Farms. You oh, sure. That's a, I think that's a key one. Yep, absolutely. Um, so as a part of this plan, you can see um, we are encouraging via striping, altering the Cumberland Farms access closest to the intersection to right in only. Uh, their secondary access would remain as is, but again, trying to remove the number of vehicular conflict points that are right in the immediate vicinity of this intersection. Um, and that's kind of one of the pieces that fits into that. The other thing is, did 
you, uh, or is there going to be at the, uh, when there's a lot of traffic, um, it doesn't necessarily matter how wonderful this intersection is set up. So have you modeled it to see what happens at the height of uh, uh, parents taking kids to school and things like that, what the backup's going to be in either direction? So Sebago was not tasked with anything on the planning side and the traffic analysis side. Everything was done as a part of that TY Lynn study. So we're taking what they did for analysis and moving forward with their final recommendation. So we have not personally done any sort of updated analysis. Okay. <clears throat> Councilor Jordan, we can circle back to Tom Erico with that specific question yeah, as well, just to see about how has evaluation uh, factored that into the design? Yeah, because a lot of the accidents are caused, well, what I have observed yeah. when I'm at Cumberland Farm, um, is that the fact that there's multiple ways to get in and out on both sides, so, so fixing that issue, um, and that, um, how should I say it, when there's a lot of traffic going on, there's a lot of confusion about who's doing what, because uh, people get really polite. And no, so. Mu very much agree. And, you, and, and hopefully with the separation uh, growing, yeah. that stops the attempt to kind of shoot the, shoot the diagonal uh, with this. So yeah. that's kind of the, the hope. Uh, now, uh, looking at this project, and uh, thank you, Nikki, for that, uh, always comes down to the question of funding, right? Uh, which is, because this isn't an inexpensive project. However, we do have a plan uh, for funding this project. Uh, Cape Elizabeth is part of uh, PACS, which is the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System. Uh, it's, it's the home of many uh, uh, acronyms, uh, but PACS is one. We're part of the central subregion for that. So we, they divide PACS into four regions. So you've got the north, the south, the uh, uh, central, and the western subregion. So the state allocates $1.6 million to PACs to develop or to distribute evenly among those four sub subregions. So each subregion gets $400,000. We're with Portland and South Portland as part of the central subregion. So uh, as we advance this project and uh, the planning for this going forward, I uh, reached out to uh, both South Portland uh, Public Works Director and Portland's Public Works Director and said, do you all have any projects that you're looking to bring forward this year? Because, uh, and this year means we, we normally would get together right around now or you know, anywhere between January and March to, to basically show our cards and compare and see who, who has what project planned and how much it's gonna cost and what do we wanna get for or pursue for funding. Well, I said we have a really big uh, project that's been on the, on, you know, evaluated multiple times in the past 30 plus years uh, we, we started a, a, a nice project in 2020, and we, we think we're close to the deployment stage now. Uh, we know it's going to cost it around $800,000. Uh, does anybody have any plans for those funds? And they came back and said, please use the funds. So $400,000 of this project comes from the uh, state MPI funds that comes to the subregion. So half of the, half the budget comes from that. So that's not going to impact the taxpayers because the funds are there. The second part of the funding comes from, if you recall from last summer, uh, segment seven and eight uh, sidewalk construction took place uh, from, from basically from across the street all the way to uh, Fowler Road. So there were funds remaining from that as that project came in under budget. So those funds were generated from the town center TIF district, which is the town center and new real estate development that takes place, those funds that are generated from new development from when that tax increment financing district was established, uh, all that new growth is sheltered. Well, that sheltered growth or new value generates revenue. That revenue then has to be, because of the way that this is designed, needs to be held in a separate account, which is the town center TIF account. Those funds went back, because they were not used, need to go back into that account. Those funds can be used for stormwater, for sidewalks, for uh, public safety improvements. Those are all part of the approved uh, elements of the TIF that the town council approved years ago when they established that TIF. Well, those funds went back in. We're using those remaining funds from last year's project 
revenues that were generated in last year's fiscal year or the current and the current fiscal year and then the coming fiscal year for FY25 that we're about to be into and it will fully fund the project. So there will not be an impact on Cape Elizabeth taxpayers as far as changing of the mill rate related to the implementation. So the project's paid for is what I'm uh, taking a ways to say, but I want to make sure you had all the detail as to, as to how we got to that moment. So we do have that lined up and ready to go. Uh, the one thing I will say is those funds need to be expended in calendar year 25. So we, they make the allocation in 24 for spending in 25. So that's why we're looking at this project for a deployment next spring is when we would go in the fall to, you, go, you know, we would go out uh, for proposals. We'd just issue our RFP, get our information back from, you know, the multiple different firms that will be jumping at the chance to do this great project and then uh, we'll have that set up and ready, to, and ready for funding for next spring. And that's, uh, that's how we're looking at getting, getting that done. And I went right through the other two points on the, uh, on the checklist, so I'm happy to answer any questions on that side. Oh. Uh, Councilor Jordan. A couple of questions. Um, and maybe this is the, for Jay, but how long, how long is it anticipated the project would take and how would we reroute traffic uh, around that uh, intersection? And we'd, um, I'm sure we're doing one side and then the other, and then to have Shore Road uh, uh, touch during uh, school season and tourist season is kind of a challenge. Jay, so Jay, maybe Jay that's can, a Jay question. Yeah, Jay can definitely answer that. I know the one thing I will say is as with any project that impacts town center, there will be no work done beach to beacon week. <laughs> we always, we, all, those, really? all those contracts say, <laughs> as of Thursday, you're out of here. So if you notice that, uh, but Jay can answer the specific uh, okay. planning questions on it. And, and we'll avoid Memorial Day Parade yep. too, probably. Yep. <laughs> uh, typically, we will give a contractor about 90 calendar days to start and complete a project of this size. Um, we haven't really gotten to that level of detail, but that's sort of the, the worst case scenario. So you're looking at, you know, somewhere between two and three months from absolute start to total completion. And on a project like this, we would keep, um, and we would work it into our specifications that the contractor would have to keep one lane of traffic moving at all times. So um, the good news with this project is the majority of the work is, is sort of outside of the lane areas. Um, so we should be able to keep traffic moving fairly well on, on all, of the, um, all of the approaches, like Scott Dyer. Um, certainly, school zone uh, is something to be considered, and morning traffic and PM traffic. So that's um, something we'll have to build into our, our contracts with our, um, with our bidders to make sure they're aware that you know, we need to keep traffic moving through town center. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, I, well, I had a question for uh, the town manager, but I also have a question for Jay, so um, I'll ask the town manager first. On the funding, you said that about 400,000 came from the tax, and the other 400 comes from uh, a balance from the sidewalk project. What was that, about 225? Was it 100, 135 we had remaining, Jay? Yeah, we just year. did a, tra a transfer back in January um, with the council. I think it was about 220. That oh, we sorry, yeah, it was 220. So then we have uh, revenues that are generated in this year's uh, commitment, and that will go to that. That's another 120,000 or so, and then next year's is even greater. Uh, so we'll have that. All of that comes together from the TIF. <clears throat> from the TIF, yes. And what is what is the balance? Does the TIF have a balance right now, and what is it? By the end of this fiscal year, it will be roughly 345,000. <clears> so, that, excuse me, that, that would be by July, uh, June, by at the end of like June 30th, uh, it'll be roughly 345,000. And that can only be used for certain. Only can be used for town town center related projects. And um, <clears throat> a couple of questions for Jay, if I might. Sure. I'm not an engineer. Um, 
I noticed that the study that was done indicated in 2019, almost five years ago, that the number of vehicles passing through this intersection was about, four, it was 1,367, 1,367 in that 12-hour period. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering how much that matters and whether or not in the ensuing five years you would expect that the traffic would be greater than that. And a secondary question that comes to mind is whether or not our anticipated removal of 1,400 feet of Sawyer Road would have, would be, would have any impact on this intersection in terms of diverting traffic. So I guess the question is, you know, are we comfortable are we comfortable with the assumptions that we're making with regard to daily traffic going through this intersection? Sure, sure, good, good questions and comments. Uh, I would say that Councilor Jordan also mentions uh, what we call in the traffic world is level of service. Um, so it might be worth um, going back or at least getting the baseline from TY Lynn and then doing some modeling to see if our traffic is increasing or decreasing. So that kind of plays into your vehicle counts um, concern and question, and I think that would be a, a good exercise to, to follow up on. So I, I think we'll maybe add that to our scope of work before we move forward uh, to make sure that we're, we're handling capacity in the future. Yeah. With regards to Sawyer Road, uh, we can certainly look at that as well. I, th I think my initial reaction um, is that Spurwink Ave would be the only um, area, Scott Dyer at Spurwink or Scott uh, Spurwink at Wells. Um, you know, those areas, um, I would say we would want to make sure is, is that capacity, we have the capacity for Sawyer Road if that were to be closed. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that translates uh, a mile easterly to the Scott Dyer Ocean House Road intersection. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we're good there. Yeah, um, I noticed that the current study um, recommends basically the same solution as the 2003 study, except that it eliminates the traffic light. Is that correct? Yes. So I, that raises two questions. Here we are 20 years later. We're 21 years later. We're saying the same thing, only off the traffic light. So I'm wondering why we're, we don't want to do the traffic light. And the second question is, there were quite a few emails from the public that came in in connection with this item. And most of them mentioned the idea of a peanut-shaped rotary or a round rotary. And I'm wondering if those options were considered and if they were discarded, what, what the reasoning would be. Sure. So with regards to the traffic signal, um, the main Department of Transportation has ultimate authority when it comes to signalized intersections statewide. And so they have the review and, and approval authority with regards to that anywhere in the state. And when T.Y. Lynn did their uh, analysis in 2019-20, it didn't meet all of the criteria necessary to meet what's called the warrant. It's called a signal warrant analysis. So they do a signal warrant analysis. If it meets all the criteria, then a town or city can move forward with um, a signalized intersection. And in this case, it did not meet that, that warrant analysis. So that's why the signal has been sort of put aside. Well, in 1990, <clears throat> the study did warrant the signal and then in 2003 it didn't do you do you, can you do you have any observations about what what the reason for that might be i would have to get both analysis in front of us and have a traffic engineer review that and i just i know that 2000 the ty land report it did not meet the criteria yeah, my understanding of the 1990 study, they did recommend, it did warrant a traffic light, but it was not recommended um, due to the degrading of level of services on Route 77, which I take to mean that people didn't want to stop for a traffic light. 
it's quite possible, yes. Uh, the second component, the, the roundabout uh, option, has been looked at. Um, I was just informed earlier today, um, this predates me, but during the 20, 2008 um, round of study that the roundabout concept was looked at and uh, one of the setbacks with regards to the roundabout is the amount of geographic area you need uh, in order to build a circle. And with our alignment with Scott Dyer Road and Shore Road being offset, those right-of-ways are offset. So in order to put a circle, you're going to have to get onto private properties and start affecting businesses, entryways, and parking areas and property. So. I think that might be one of the main reasons why a roundabout has been um, sort of put aside as a, a recommended option. And the recommended pr um, changes that you saw tonight are all within the right of way. So we have the ability to deliver this project without having to acquire property rights. Okay, Councilor Anderson, yeah, looking at it a, a couple different times over the years, if, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, sorry for jumping in. Um, it, was, it would have required a significant taking of uh, the four cornered properties uh, that, that would there well, at least half of them, if not most of them would look at a significant taking which would have uh, had significant cost. Uh, I mean, not the cost is the only driver, but uh, there is, that is something that we do need to consider. Uh, but the takings was the big thing as far as the size of the rotary that one would need to construct, even if it was you know, peanut shaped, or if it was if it was a round rotary, you, we'd still looking at uh, exponential costs when it would come to that. And more importantly, the taking of private property, which is not exactly popular. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, just one more. Um, did we? Um, is there a consideration for bicyclists in this? In this scenario, do we have bike lanes? I didn't. There's a, there's a five foot shoulder that is there, uh, as, as Nikki had, had spoken about, uh, which is consistent with uh, where we're at, at now. Uh, part of the thought being, and I can say this, I, I mean, I, I ride about 1,000 to 1,200 miles a year. Uh, getting the traffic to slow down and giving the intersection a bit of a diet, as well as offsetting the, uh, or, or increasing that distance and having greater separation through there. Uh, a, the thought is it will improve the safety because you won't have, as we are uh, speaking with Councilor Jordan earlier, that shooting the diagonal in there, uh, the giving the road a bit of a diet tends to slow the through traffic down a bit, but you also still have a five foot travel, uh, travel lane. It gets a little bit wider further up uh, when you get up, you know, outer 77 uh, further south of town. Uh, but generally, the five foot width is, uh, is considered what you'd have for normal uh, outside of putting in the, uh, you know, the signalized or the, sorry, the stencils, yeah, stencils on the, on the ground. Any further questions from the councillors? Anyone to my left? Nope. All right, seeing none. Mr. Sturgis and Jay, do you have any other? Are we having public yes, comment on this? Public comment on Are it. we having public comment on this item? We, we could. And I think it's a great <laughs> idea. I didn't see it listed, but we could, I mean, sure. All right, so we'll invite public comment. I know uh, Ms. Tennyson online had her hand up. Uh, she's, you will be. She's taking it down. You're so. taking it down. Okay, so the chair will now recognize Mr. John Voltz. Hello, <clears throat> John Voltz, 33 Phillip Road. So I'm delighted that you're finally addressing this intersection, but I have to say I'm extremely sort of disappointed with the solution, and here's why. We saw in the housing survey that people really do want a walkable, vibrant town center. And this solution won't do that. If you look at what the peanut intersections are, I'd like to confirm that that was not actually studied. They're meant for offset roads exactly like this. It's true, a round one won't fit because we don't have, uh, we have a narrow right of way in the middle of that road, but that's why it looks like a peanut 
in the peanut rotary. It's narrow in the middle. It fits into the right-of-way. It's wide where we have wide right-of-way. And these, the circumference of these traffic circles is not what you're thinking of as a big rotary. They're really small. You get alternating traffic, better throughput, better car safety, better pedestrian safety, better bicycle safety. You make it a much more possible to build where we're going, not just to avoid car crashes, but to build a vibrant, walkable town center. So please double check and confirm that something like a peanut rotary actually won't work, or if it won't, how much taking actually does need to occur to make that work. Because this is one of those critical decisions. What you see there when they square it up, what you mean is you've got the traffic going down 77, and it's going straight. And you know what happens when you go straight through a crosswalk. People go fast to make it. They're not paying attention. And we've now, instead of dividing the pedestrian traffic, at least on one intersection where you can go partway across, and then so you can cross one lane at a time, both, in this current design, every single time you have to cross both lanes of traffic. There's no pedestrian islands at all. That's also a mistake. Whatever you do, consider pedestrians bicyclists and people who are going to make this town center walkable and vibrant first, not vehicles first. If you make it safe for the pedestrians and bicycles, it'll be safe for the cars. Guarantee. Please reconsider this. Look at the peanut rotary. Think about the pedestrians and bicyclists that we're trying to get into our town center. This won't do it. You're, still, you're going to have people run over in those straightaway intersections. I can tell you right now. Thank you, Mr. Volz. We'll ask the next gentleman to come up to the mic and give his name and address, please. Brian Harris. I live at 34 Farm Hill Road. Um, decided to walk over tonight to just kind of get another view of it. But I had sent out the town council uh, that concept of the peanut rotary. As far as I know, I couldn't find examples that weren't built in the last five years. So any previous look at this intersection, the, the, the concept didn't exist. Um, the examples I sent were from Worcester, New Haven, Inman Square and Cambridge. It's a, I've been in, at least in one of those locations. It works. Inman Square and Cambridge is an impossible intersection, and it actually solved an intersection that they had had so much trouble with for years. They had, I think, five streets intersecting. Um, the, I think it was slightly incorrect that a, a, I agree that a rotary does not fit in that intersection, but uh, two separate rotaries. I, I'm not a traffic engineer, but I know how large of traffic lane is, I laid it out, it fits, um, you know, on a very rudimentary level. I don't think this has been looked at. I haven't found anything to suggest that it's been looked at. Um, it, it addresses a lot of issues, and the biggest issue, it's not really the cutting across, it's the pulling out and you have to come to a stop and then take a left into one of those roads. That's a dangerous movement. This design does not solve that movement. It create, it, that movement still exists. And I think the general consensus is leave the intersection as it is until we find a, a strong solution for the intersection. It doesn't make sense to spend 800000 to make tiny curb changes and not really solve the, the problem. So I think there's, there's a possible solution uh, that I think it's worth taking time to explore. Uh, and I just wouldn't want to see the town spend all that money and then kind of lose the opportunity to do it right. There's also the right of way is bigger than the roadway. The town to the southwest corner of the intersection owns a large chunk of that sidewalk area in the right of way. So when we think of the road, there's the road, there's the curb, so that the right of way is actually significantly larger than it, than it is now. So I think there's more than enough room within the right of way to fit a solution that can actually ad address and solve some of the problems we're trying to figure out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'm going to jump to oh, Ms. Tennyson was there. Did she disappear? She's uh, rejoining right now, Mr. Chair. Maybe just a moment. So they, I've seen go to Mr. Dunning. All right. Well, we'll get Mr. while we're waiting for <laughs> go online, the chair recognize Tom Dunham. Uh, Tom Dunham, Dunham 11, uh, Becky's Cove Lane. <clears throat> I was spent quite a bit of time many years ago when they were planning to do a cul-de-sac 
and you are correct, the dimensions there really, they couldn't squeeze it in there. <clears throat> but then I look at this plan, and I really don't think we accomplished much at all. And, I, and um, I'm concerned because over the past three or four years, we live on Shore Road, the traffic from Fort Williams has uh, grown significantly. So it, I know there's a school issue in the morning and a, you know, when school gets out, but there's another component here that is really accelerated, and that's people leaving Fort Williams and coming over and, and to the center of town. And I think the members need to look at that. <clears throat> and if you're doing all these studies based on 1990, which I thought I heard, I think it's gone up significantly. So I, I think we need to look at it again, because I don't think you're achieving much at all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunham. The, the chair will now recognize Ms. Tennyson online, Melanie Tennyson. And your microphone should be hot, Ms. Tennyson. Yep. Hi. Um, thank you so much for trying to call on me so many times. <laughs> um, I'm not sure this was mentioned, but the TIF money that is supposed to be done for projects at the town center, I know there's a lot of demand for sidewalks, and also we should really have a school zone sign right by the town hall. That is really a, a safety issue in my mind, and it's, it should be in place. So that found money in the TIF district, there's plenty of places for it. And I feel that this, I've been in re a resident of this town for a long time, and this is just a Band-Aid on a wound that's not gonna heal. And I still don't understand why a roundabout or a traffic circle, um, whatever we're gonna call it, rotary uh, isn't required. Our traffic is, is only grown exponentially more people are driving their kids. They have complicated schedules. Absolutely, the traffic at Fort Williams, other people want to go to two lights after going to the fort, and I don't feel like this is going to solve anything. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Tennyson, for those comments. And now the chair will recognize Mary Ann Lynch. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann Lynch, two old colony lane uh, first i want to thank the town council the manager and jay for paying attention to this intersection this has been a topic near and dear to my heart for about 40 years when i first lived on scott dyer road and now have lived off of scott uh, off of shore road as a young mother i had to navigate this intersection every single day and later on, I had to worry about my kids, my teenage drivers, making those turns. So um, I really do appreciate that it is still on the radar. Um, I am concerned that this proposal is a Band-Aid and um, doesn't go far enough. Um, I believe that the 2003 study determined that a traffic light was warranted. And I know for a fact, because I was on the council, that the town had MDOT approval for a traffic light at the, this intersection in 2008. Um, I don't know and I don't have the expertise to determine whether a rotary or a peanut or a traffic light is the best solution, but I am concerned that just refiguring and squaring it off will not lead to much additional safety. I'm also concerned that to the extent that there is a desire to increase housing and housing density in the town center, we're going to be adding additional uh, property, uh, additional cars. I'd like to suggest that if this proposal is compatible with a future traffic light, then I would support the present proposal. The town would get a chance to see the efficacy of the reconsideration uh, of the reconfiguration and see whether this does lead to making this a safer intersection for cars, bikers, and pedestrians. So my question to you tonight is to ask you, will this design support a future traffic light if three or four years down the road we see that this is still a high crash intersection? I would hate to see us 
spend a lot of money and have it not support a traffic light. But it looks to me very similar to the 2003 to 2008 activities. And finally, I'm delighted that you have the money in hand. It was a tremendous disappointment to me in 2008 when after five years of work, the town council by a tie vote decided not to go forward with the traffic light and had to return about a million dollars to MDOT. So I would urge you not to let perfection be the enemy of the good, but make sure you're doing something that really will improve safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lynch. And next, uh, our chair will recognize Michael Friedland. Hi, Mike Friedland, 287 Ocean House Road. I'm one of the owners of the Lumbery. And uh, my concern with this plan is um, I, I go there every day that my biggest concern is the Cumberland Farms exit, the one closest to Shore Road. And uh, I wonder if we pulled up the accident reports, if I, I would almost bet that over 50% were caused because of that um, entrance exit. And it seemed like the proposed solution was to say that the, the entrance in question is an entrance only. Doesn't seem like a realistic solution because when you pull in the other entrance, you can't really turn around and go back through the pumps to get out the other way. Unless it was only one way in and one way out, but that wasn't clear to me. Um, but that being said, I do really like the peanut proposal, and I do think it's worth looking into, because um, the fear is that we'll spend all this money and we actually won't address the true cause of the issue or it won't make much of a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Friedland. Are there any other members of the public who would like to comment? All right, seeing none. That ends the comment on that item. Uh, Councilor Gillis. I have a question for Jay about the, um, what Marianne had brought up, whether that the proposal would handle the traffic light down the road if we were to go in that direction and then found we needed a traffic light. Would, would that work in that spot? What we would have to do is have our engineers um, review that and make sure that the geometry does uh, work for a future signal arrangement. And I think that would be kind of important to yep. make sure it would eventually uh, support that. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody for the, you know, the reason why we bring a presentation like this forward is to get additional input and bring it to the public as we've done with other projects in the past, so we'll definitely take you know the input that we received tonight back to the design team and uh, put that into the mix as well. As far as the, I know, Nikki and Steve and Jay and I were all taking notes, so uh, we'll bring that back and and regroup our forces, so to speak. Oh, I'm out of time, so uh, <laughs> we'll group. <laughs> That's it. We'll regroup and we'll bring back. Uh, you know, we'll we'll evaluate and come back with more as 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 we evolve as well. So it's a. Uh, we are grateful for the input that we have on it. Uh, um, so just to clarify, so does that mean that we'll be taking a look at some of the options around um, trap signalization and potential use of a, of a, of a peanut? We'll have, to, we'll have to throw that into the mix. Um, I think so just it, and, and just to add to what's already been said, um, I think in addition to having some um, concept of impact on traffic flow and cost, um, I'd also be interested to um, learn, understand if we move from a project that's largely happening within the town's right-of-ways to one that's going to require work within the state's right-of-way, um, how that changes timelines and, um, and cost structures and coordination with the state. Yeah, we would definitely, yeah, we'd definitely have to have that all as part of the considerations uh, for sure. Thanks. Uh, Councilor Jordan. Yes. <laughs> She's jumping up. I want to see if we can model a peanut. Can we do that? I really, I agree with what people have said is that, you know, if we're going to do this, let's, I, and we've been working on it for an eternity, 
um, what, why can't we see if a uh, peanut um, kind of roundabout works? Yes, as I otherwise, said. Otherwise, we're going to, as we move through this project, we're going to get the question again and again and again and again, and then we're going to implement it, and everybody goes, why didn't you look at a peanut? So <laughs> let's do it. We will have to go back with our design team, take, as I said, we'll have to take a look at, especially as to, you know, what we've received recently as well as tonight. So we'll throw it into the mix for sure as it comes to that. And also update a traffic study. If, with car counts uh, that will need, yes, the top of my list here was actually updated. The most recent that I saw on the state's DOT site and, and that was 19. So we'll just have to see what we can grab for if there's more current data. And we may have, you know, we may have to run a, run a line uh, along those lines as well. Uh, when I mean a line, I mean like a car count uh, meter to do that. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely keep that front of mind as well. I know, like <clears throat> many of you, I, I have encountered in well, of course, New England is famous for roundabouts and rotaries and all that. And I've encountered even in Northern Virginia, you know, like Loudoun, Fairfax, small roundabouts. And that seem to work very well. So that's probably what some of the folks have in mind. So definitely worth looking at. Okay. Do we need any action at all? I don't see. No, it was uh, strict, strict, okay. strictly... Um, for updating the council for us to move forward. So we'll, you, we'll update and we'll come back again later with uh, okay. where, where we are next before we go to launch, I guess would be the best way to put it, Mr. Chairman. All right. And the, and the timing on this is all good too, right, Matt? Yes. We've, got, we've got plenty of time to do everything we need to do to relook at some of these other things. And the project comes on board, it's got to be done in 25, yes. right? Yes, yeah, we're looking we got, to do it in We've got the time to do it right too. Yep. Good. All right. So the next, thank you everybody. The next item, 10, to consider approving funds for an intercom system at the Thomas Memorial Library up to $50,000, $50,066. And we begin with an opportunity for public comment on this item, would anyone in the room or online like to comment on the request to approve funds for an intercom system at the Thomas Memorial Library. All right, seeing none, I think to initiate the discussion, I would entertain a motion. We have a draft motion. Would someone like to make that? Council Anderson. Second that. Second by Councilor Jordan. Thank you. Do I need to read it to the record, or uh, what's best for the? Let's see. Uh, uh, while I'm surfing over here, uh, I just want to take the opportunity to thank our library director, Ms. Rachel Davis, who's here with us this evening for, for putting all this work together. As I referred to her this morning in our uh, department head meeting as our, our unofficial director of development, because she does such good work on, on the fundraising side, and uh, the library is very fortunate to have uh, a lot of largesse that comes its way, which we are eternally grateful for, and her staff and their hard work to come up with ideas. And this is strictly to improve uh, the safety for the operations in, in the facility, and it's much overdue. So I wanted to express our, our gratitude for Rachel for, for moving this forward. Um, but this would be this evening would be to uh, authorize the expenditure of, of, those, of the amount of $50,066.18 from the library agency fund uh, for the installation of the ADA compliant intercom system. All right, so this has been moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Jordan. Any further discussion? All right, we can vote. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. All right, the next item. Request from Councillor Anderson to consider amending the town fee schedule for ADUs. And we begin with an opportunity for public comment, as always. Would anyone like to comment on this item? Please come up to the mic. And 
Chair, recognize John Volz. Um, <clears throat> John Volz, 33 Phillips Road. So earlier you described very briefly the, gen the genesis of this. I think it's a fine idea. I encourage it. I'd really like to understand, though, why you chose not to go forward with ADU kits, because it seems to me that it is a much bigger barrier to someone considering an ADU than a fee, building fee, which comes much later down the line and is really not a significant portion of the overall cost. So if we're trying to encourage ADUs, this is a great you know, step in the right direction, but it seems much more minor. So I just want to understand why did you choose not to do that? It would be really helpful and related to this issue, but as you explained it, thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. I was a little disappointed about that. I had this fantasy that we could um, have an ADU kit with uh, three or four or five architectural designs that people could pick and say, oh, that one looks good, but just, you know, move the door here. That was my, I guess it was a fantasy because it turned out after uh, Maureen looked into it and spoke with a couple of architects, uh, there were two fundamental problems with that. One, each design would cost probably $35,000, and we only had 50000 in the grant, so if we had gone forward with the grant, we could have gotten one design from one architect, and it became, you know, who do you pick and how do you do it, and it didn't seem like it was getting the job done. And the second issue with that is that with changes in ordinances, uh, these designs may be obsolete uh, in two or three years. And so that's why we're not happy. But we are sort of doing, I'm hoping to do the ADU toolkit. It, I'd like it to include architectural designs, and maybe we can do something like that through the town. But to start at least with... Um, a special page for ADUs with frequently asked questions, a list of the new ordinances, and this idea was given as sort of a marketing or incentive to help people initially. And so that's why, that, that, that's how that came about. And when I asked to have this on the agenda, I didn't know or realize or remember or whatever that we are taking up the um, Housing Diversity Study Committee on Wednesday night. Um, and this was also a recommendation in that report. I mean, it came out of the meeting that we had on the grant, but it also came out as a recommendation on the housing study. So I, I think it's really reasonable. I'd like to support it. But if people would rather wait till Wednesday, um, I understand. But that's the answer to your question, Mr. Volz. Would any other member of the public like to comment on this issue of the ADU fees? Uh, anyone online? All right, seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I'll make the Councillor Gabrielson. Um, I, I, I would move that we uh, uh, approve the proposed change to the fee schedule. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Thompson. Okay. Any further discussion? I just have a general question. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to it, but don't we usually look at our whole fee schedule during the budget process? And this fits nicely into that. I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying it fits right within our natural budget process that's happening. If I, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Y yes, that's a great question, Councilor Jordan. Uh, right now, uh, I mean, this is part of the, right now it's normally part of the building permit fee. So this would be creating a, another category. So uh, we can make it work e either way. And we would, by the time we go to review the fees during the budget process, mm -hmm. uh, now we would out now insert this as a line to say, Accessory dwelling unit building permit fee mm -hmm. is established at six dollars okay. per, uh, per uh, in relationship to the overall value. So we'll have that for a review at that point. But we can integrate it, you know, as as the motion says immediately, and then have that test period for the next you know, fourteen months uh, to get to that to get to that, so we can evaluate its uh, efficacy. Okay. 
any further questions or comments? All right, so we have a motion by Councillor Gabrielson, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Ready to vote, all in favor? Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, now the next item is request from Councillor Thompson regarding the legal fee reimbursement to the Lumbry. And we begin with a public comment and I see our first speaker. The chair recognizes Michael Friedland. Hi there, Mike Friedland, uh, 287 Ocean House Road. I'm one of the owners of the Lumbery, and I want to thank the councillors for considering this item tonight. And uh, I, there was a lot of chatter on the Cape Pod, and I, I can't uh, address everything that was said, but I think one concern was that uh, this motion by the council will set a bad precedent. And uh, I, think, I think the irony of, of that statement is that they failed to recognize that the bad precedent was set when the town chose to file a lawsuit against my business and myself and my family instead of modifying regulations in a common sense manner. I think that is the clear bad precedent that's set and uh, so much so that today I did a delivery of wood down to the Casco Bay Lines and the forklift driver saw the lumbery truck and he said, you know, what the heck? You know, what the heck happened with the town of Cape? And, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, it's rough. It was rough. And, and that, that results from the bad precedent that was set. And I think this action tonight has the potential to set a very good precedent. It has the potential to send a very good message out into the world because these, these decisions do go out into the world and people talk about it all over. And businesses hear about it, people hear about it, and, and I think this is a chance to set a precedent that uh, sends a very positive message that, you know, mistakes are made, um, accountability does matter, and we recognize this, and we want to make changes, we want to support local businesses, and we are following our words with our actions. And, and this is a strong, it's a very strong statement made tonight. And, and I hate the word precedent because it doesn't really judge an item based on itself. It sort of judges an item based on what it could be. And I think this action has the potential to do good things, but I just think that this action in itself is the right move to do. And I do think it's going to have a very positive effect going forward in terms of the narrative that's being said about the town of Cape Elizabeth, because we want to be known as a town that not only wants a vibrant town center, but works towards achieving a vibrant town center. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity tonight. It is going to be incredibly helpful, because running a business is very difficult. And um, I just want to thank you all for all the time and all the effort that you have been put in, because I, I have been recognizing the changes that have been made, and they are substantial and significant, and they don't go unnoticed by me. I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Friedland. We are still now in the public comment period, and the chair recognizes John Volz. Good evening, John Volz, 33 Phillip Road. I think he's right, though, about, about precedent. The challenge is, my understanding is that the town and the Lumbery and Mr. Friedman sat down and were part of a settlement process. And that's the normal process for settling disputes with the town. And I believe that came to a conclusion. People were relatively content with the settlement process. And that's usually the end of it. And the precedent you're setting is that anybody, any counterparty who engages in a conflict with the town and reaches an agreement is invited to come before you if they're not happy with the outcome and appeal to you directly, which is what's happening. All of the compensation fees, that's all part of the settlement process usually. That's the process. There's usually not a second avenue to go then 
resettled. You're inviting every single person who disagrees with how their negotiation goes to make a direct appeal to you over and over and over again. I don't know why you wouldn't try it. So is that the precedent you want to set? I can't figure out how this counterparty would be different than any other counterparty who has a disagreement with you. Now, some of this is like, the, you know, everyone was not, may have made mistakes on both sides. I don't know. But the, that's what the settlement process is there to decide. And we went through it, and you're either going to stick to it or you're not going to stick to it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Boltz. Would anyone else like to comment on this item? Anyone online? There's a hand online, Mr. Chairman, from Paul E. W. Paul E., we are going to make your microphone live now. Should be good. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Wilcox. Wilcox. I'm sorry, I don't have the W, my whole name. I'm um, <laughs> not techie enough. Um, I wish I were there to say this in person, but just kind of a general thought. Rules of communication in a community were set up a certain way years ago. And the internet has brought another kind of conversation availability. And I, I feel very um, uncomfortable that we have resources with lots of conflict, conflict being shared online and I feel like we are um, trying in some ways to act like we are the national news instead of a community. And therefore, I, I think I'd like to see a little bit more um, understanding on the part of the different parties involved and not the sense of putting people in positions that could jeopardize more than just losing their business, but really make a significant financial and insurance wise and legal wise cost to a new business. I wish I could say this with more depth, but my hope is that we've all learned from this process and the next process can be influenced by this, but this is not the Supreme Court. Not to be dramatic, but I, I feel it's just important to remember this is a community and we're trying to work things out in a positive way so that the community can grow in resident numbers and in complementary business numbers. The end. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Wilcox. Would anyone else in the public like to comment? Okay. I, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Council Anderson. Was there a settlement? Was there a settlement here? Mr. Volz referred to a settlement, and I, I know that there was a motion for a mediation, but to my knowledge, that did not occur, and there was no settlement. Is that correct? Was there a settlement? If I may, through the chair, uh, Councilor Anderson, your question is great, and thank you for the point of uh, clarification. Uh, no, there was not a settlement. Uh, what happened was the council uh, directed the town uh, manager and the town's attorney to uh, basically bring the proceedings to an end, and then uh, and then work on trying to find a uh, legislative solution locally would be the way I would describe it. And that's what staff did as we were directed. But there was not a settlement and a findings on either, on either direction. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Councilor Thompson. One of the reasons I think it, it would be reasonable for Mr. Friedland to expect a conversation about a settlement 
or some kind of financial um, assistance on this was it's your September, your September 11th meeting, which obviously I was not a member of the council. As part of all of the conversations about the things that needed to be dealt with, fixed, changed, Im improved upon, ordinances, processes, procedures, I think it was uh, Councillor Jordan, or Councillor Harriman that mentioned we may even need to consider reimbursing Mr. Friedland for some of his legal fees. So for, for Mr. Friedland to have that in his thought, that once all of these processes and procedures and improvements were were uh, put in place and the, set, and the lawsuit was uh, set, that piece was uh, uh, dropped. Um, is it reasonable for him, after that comment, for him to expect that at least we would consider it? It might be the reason that drove him to send the request to us in the first place. And I would certainly like to have some kind of an understanding, whether it's coming from Councillor Harriman, what she was thinking, or what the other councillors that were on the council at the time thought, but I don't think it's unreasonable for uh, Mr. Friedland to be making this request. Councilor Harriman, or, oh, okay, Councilor Gillis. Yes. I think we were just kind of throwing things out I there. I hear you, Susan. <laughs> I think we were just trying to throw things out there, trying to figure out a solution for this. I don't, I don't think it, I don't think she meant like, okay, let's write him a check and, and I'll go from there. Yeah, I was going to say, I wish I had as good a memory as you do of everything that comes out of my mouth, but I don't even remember <laughs> saying that. So I don't remember you saying it, but I know, I'm but I mean, like we, I would have we to, we were all kind of talking about stuff. Right. Like I would have, I would have just been talking and, and throwing ideas out there. It wasn't like a planned you, no. you don't recall saying on September 11th that we may even need to think about renew? Did, did you look that up for, for this meeting, or did you just know in your head that on September I was remind, like an I was, hour ago, did you know? No, it? no, so not an hour ago. Exactly. So, like, maybe somebody could have said to me, review September 11th's meeting and, and figure out what it was that you were thinking if you're going to bring that up to me right now. Because that was, what, five months ago? I'm sorry, I don't remember what exactly was happening that night five months ago. I apologize. As, as, as the chair, I'll clarify that in reviewing the motion that uh, Councillor Harriman is correct, that the motion that was voted on five to two was to I amend the motion I had made, a motion to dismiss, was moved to amend to afford, secure a voluntary dismissal and to scheduling a mediation at a workshop open to the public to identify steps that need to be taken and who are the parties responsible to complete each task to bring resolution and put a stay of violations during the process. So the matter of fees was not part of the formal motion, if that helps. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, I did review the videotape. Good. And, um, well, remind me, what did happen? Okay. <laughs> what happened was um, that Councilman Reiniger had a motion to dismiss the lawsuit. Councillor Caitlin Harriman. Uh, made a motion to amend to send it to a town council workshop in a public mediation that works on a solution in the town chambers and open to the public. And you stated, in, in this workshop, we should identify what steps need to be taken to get this resolved, identify ordinances that need to be changed, um, have a new site plan approved, that the town would hire a mediator at the town's expense, Consider the amount of money we've already collected from the lumbery. Consider waiving future costs and fees, and consider reimbursement if that is necessary. Right. Those were your exact words. And um, Penny Jordan supported the motion. And um, my recollection is that 
Well, actually, it's not my recollection. It's what happened. Um, Penny stated, we need to sit down and have a conversation, and this con we should have taken these actions two or three years ago. Right. right. So where I get with this, I'll tell you my analysis, if I may. I think, I think we have to be concerned about setting a bad precedent. I think we have to be concerned that we don't hamstring or put a chilling effect on our code enforcement officials that want to enforce the law. I don't think we want to encourage the kind of reaction that Mr. Volt suggested that anyone that doesn't like anything can come to town and and try to get, you know, expenses reimbursed. When I look at this situation, I, I sort of analyze it in terms of, this is kind of like a request for restitution. And I, I do agree with Mr. Thompson that, with Councilor Thompson, that um, Mike Friedland was reasonable to bring this request based on the September 11th meeting that there was a suggestion out there that such a thing might be possible and appropriate. Um, so my question is, should the town pay restitution? And I believe that it would be appropriate only if there was some sort of wrongdoing or culpability on the part of the town or any of its agents. And the specter of that possibility was raised in the September 11th meeting. Now, I, I do not have enough information to know if there was, I, in order for me to support this, I would need to find or believe that there was some element of unreasonableness or arbitrariness or animus against the business, or animus against Mr. Friedland, or some sort of, I don't think it needs to rise to the level of bad faith, but some level of culpability on the part of the town. And I think if that were the case, I would be supporting this. I don't know if that's the case. I was not on the town council. I was not privy to its meetings. I don't know how this lawsuit got generated, uh, what conversations were had, what were there, were there opportunities to resolve this two and three years earlier than when it finally got resolved? Why did it take that long to amend the ordinance? Um, those are the questions I have. And I, I would need more information before raising my hand in favor of reimbursing legal fees. And I would like the opportunity to get that kind of information. How do you propose to get it? Um, if we could refer this to the Finance Committee and maybe have the Finance Committee uh, put together a list of questions, get information. I don't know. Do you have a suggestion? No, I was asking you. You're the one who put the uh, idea forward. I, I don't think there was, a, this is my opinion, uh, I do not believe there was anything that was uh, targeting a particular business for anything, I think the town was trying to uh, follow a, I'll say, a process of, uh, and um, I think that where I come from is that it would be wonderful, uh, and I understand why Tim put this on the um, on the agenda, but I think we truly have to think about precedents. I truly do, because there are other, there could be things that happened in the past that uh, people could use the same um, 
the same approach and we'd be on a slippery slope if we head down this road. And I can uh, empathize with what that level of legal fee feels like to a small business. Um, I can only imagine. Um, but I, I really think that we don't want to go down a slippery slope. And maybe it's that we speak with our uh, town attorney and work this work this through. But at this point, I I don't think at any point I'd be able to support moving forward with it. Chairman Reiniger, Council Thompson. One of the things that I, I do think we need to address, and we may need to refer this for further uh, study. But when, when you look at whether or not there's reasonable uh, expectation for reimbursement, um, if you, one of the things that, that Mr. Friedland certainly was helpful is getting the town to change some ordinances that weren't working the way they should, to change some processes and procedures that weren't working exactly the way they should as far as making it an easy town to do business. Um, I think we've made a lot of those corrections. We've, we've, I guess we've kind of recognized that, yeah, maybe he was right because we've made some of those, those improvements. As a town council, we've now got a new process on whether on how we go ahead and, and, and proceed with a lawsuit to a taxpayer in our town. We've made a change. We, this wouldn't even happen going forward based on how we've made that change in and of itself. We, we went into executive session in a different way to, to do something like that. So this, this lawsuit with this council wouldn't even have been pursued the way it was, because as I understand it, only two of the sitting town councilors even knew it was going forward. So at the very least, uh, what Mr. Friedland's gone through, what the Lumbery's gone through, it's, it's helped us get some processes and procedures in place that are better, easier to maneuver, uh, easier to do business, but it, it probably would be worthwhile um, to examine this a little further, because uh, I, I do there, think there were other, I mean, uh, I got feedback from, from an individual that was on the planning board that felt, and I'm not gonna mention the name, but somebody that felt that, that the treatment of uh, Mr. Freeland on just paving his parking lot, he had initial approval to pave the parking lot, and then that got stopped, and he had to go back and spend a lot of money to, Supposedly, it's not in, it was not in our ordinance, but he was required to go and examine that whether or not he needed to put another layer of pavement on and treat his parking lot like our roads, okay? And after doing that, yeah, so another thing he won, another victory he had, but it cost him thousands of dollars to go through that process. So was there, was there individuals that were treating Mr. Friedland in a way that wasn't fair? Possibly. But that was a, you know, he didn't have to put that second layer of pavement on, but he had to go through the process to prove why he shouldn't have had to. And uh, it wasn't part of our, as I understand, if Penny will correct me, but uh, um, I don't, I didn't have any predisposition of how I wanted to, to vote on this tonight. I didn't have any, I hadn't talked to any of the counselors. Um, I've been accused by some of the oracles in town that I had a, a uh, quid pro quo, my morality, my uh, integrity has been questioned. I mean, all I was doing was bringing an item. There's even it, it, that, uh, I, you know, we'd already, I'd already voted on this. And all I did was ask the chair and the manager to put this on the agenda tonight. So there's obviously only a lot of people that are wound up about this. Um, but I didn't have any expectation that we were gonna deal with this tonight in a vote. Uh, I'm not sure you all have enough information to deal with it on a vote, but at the very least, maybe we ought to go back and review um, what what you all had as an intention when you discussed this as part of all the discussion uh, and, and see what was actually said on that September 11th meeting. If I may ask the uh, town manager, Mr. Sturgis, is there any example or precedent of the town ever having previously 
paid legal fees in connection with a dispute? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. No. What was the question? If, we, if, if the town has uh, paid another party's legal fees, and historically we have not. Has the town ever filed a lawsuit against a business and the owner as an individual? I want to say I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, I do know the reason why was because in all the filings with the uh, with the AG's office, as far as the the DBA uh, and who the individuals were related to the party, uh, it was Mr. Friedland was the the party that was named in all the documents at the AG's level. So with the LLC and all that, so the attorney I, I did follow up with our attorneys on that, and that's why the name was brought in. There were no other names that were associated with any of the paperwork at the time of the filing. So that was why uh, they cast a wide net to make sure that they get all parties who were involved with the entity uh, that are knowledgeable and recorded documents. One, one final point, Councilor Thompson. I had no intention of having this be a budget item for our this budget that we're gonna be beginning to look at next week. Um, if we were going to consider this at all, I would move this to, you know, when we look at, at, at monies, that if there was monies available from last year's budget, uh, and maybe consider it at that time. So I'm not sure that we, it might be another good reason why we don't need to make a decision on this tonight and, and look at where we are in June with regard to our budgets and unused uh, uh, surpluses, and maybe consider it at that time. Is that a motion? You'd have to table it. Make a motion to table the item then. Either table it or make an, another motion. Well, I'd make a motion that we table it and, dis and discuss it at our, at our June meeting. Okay. Oh, yeah. could, we, could we do that or just, do we just need to just table it? No, you can. Well, I'll second the motion. Then you have to stop. As soon as you second the motion, you can't yeah, talk about the conversation. Anymore. Oh, you can have discussion on the motion after you. No. Not on the motion. Okay, to I unravel that. <laughs> Rewind. Withdraw. I have a question. <laughs> All right. So right now, there's a motion by Councillor Thompson to postpone it to a June meeting, or to actually table it to table it till June. And. You know, in the meantime, I think we could pursue some of the uh, enlightenment that might be necessary, review what we've, you know, we talked about, the, maybe look at this September 11th meeting and see if there's any other uh, information we might need to look into. I'll just interject that. In we, have to, we have to move on. We have to do I'll that. second it. All right, so you're going to second the motion table. Okay. Right, so now, be, uh, to, to June 10th would be the, the date certain that you would be setting that to. Okay. If it, if it passes. So. Right. And there's no discussion on the yeah. motion table. Yeah. Well, that was, I was going to, yep. All right, so all in favor of tabling of, of this motion. All opposed. All right, I'm in favor of tabling, so it carries. You should have voted when they voted. Yeah. You may, you may want to get call, you on that. You may want to call the vote again, Mr. Do it again. <laughs> you can do a roll call. <laughs> Good point. If, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, just uh, to, with the clerk, Deb, did you get a, a count on that? I think the chairman announced it that it was four yes to table to June 10th. Okay. Uh, with councillors Gabrielson, Harriman, and Jordan opposed. Thank you. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Just wanted to make sure. No, I thank you. Okay. I'll just interject and say, in my brief experience on the council, this was the most emotional issue. You know, with uh, on all sides of the issue, and I thought that the council handled it very well. So. 
No. I tabled it, and I disagree. Uh, I think it was LD 2003 that was the most emotional. Well, that was complicated. <laughs> this was more emotional, I thought. Yeah. Okay. At any rate, thank you. All right, so next item. Request from the chair to establish an ad hoc privacy committee, opportunity for public comment, as with all of the items. And chair recognizes Mr. John Volz. Good evening. John Volz, 33 Phillip Road. So I read through the proposed committee charge, and I got to say, um, th this still seems premature in a way because. What this is, committee seems to be doing in terms of its purpose is examining relatively leading edge IT issues. And right now, if you look through the new budget that we've just published, we spend you know, somewhere around the neighborhood of six figures on software and things. But if you look at the organization chart, which is now happily included in this year's budget, you'll see that there is no IT director. So we don't even have the basis, and, 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 as a town in the organization, don't have an IT director to cover IT issues, okay? So um, it, we're, we don't do the basic stuff right now across departments. We don't have a section in technology on the budget. We don't have, you, and you look at the charge and it talks about staff, it's blank because we don't have anyone who is in charge of IT for the town. So I'm just saying, this is the kind of thing, if you want to handle advanced technological issues, which is great, you want to be a leader in those things, right. But first, we need to learn how to walk before we run. We don't even do the basic things right now. We don't look at technology across departments. We don't have, you know, we don't have anyone managing that, as far as I can tell, for the town. This seems far beyond what our capabilities are today. We don't have the staff to execute. And then the second part of this is the activities talk about the committee auditing what is essentially sensitive town data. And that just seems to be a really inappropriate role for citizens. That's the kind of thing that should be done by employees or consultants who answer to the town under an employment contract or a consultant contract. We shouldn't be having private citizens auditing and essentially doing core town work. They could advise, they could go out and look around and see what other people are doing and set policy and things, but they have no business auditing sensitive town data, none. And that's inappropriate. So this just seems premature, both in terms of our ability to function and support it, and in terms of how it's conceived of how the work would actually get done. And I would suggest that you revisit this and consider in the budget process, appointing an IT director so you'd have staff for something like this in the future. Thank you, Mr. Volz. M Mr. Chair. Uh, okay. Councilor Thompson, you hold your comment until after. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann Lynch, 2 Old Colony Lane. Um, I just n noticed this on the agenda today, and I'm not an expert at all on it, but I really was, thought it was a great idea. Um, you look around, there were cameras everywhere. There are cameras all over all of our schools. There are cameras in this building. Uh, if you apply to serve on a board or a commission, you've provided the town with a whole lot of information. If you apply um, for the senior citizen taxpayer uh, relief program, you're providing additional information. Um, so I thought it was a wonderful idea, and I hope that you go forward with it. Um, it seems to me that particularly in this town, there is a wealth of IT information, and I I'm, would be excited to be on the appointments committee to see which public-spirited citizens would apply to be on this committee and help you in this um, so that's all I have to say. I thought it was a great idea, and I hope that you move forward with it. Um, even if your ability to do certain things may be limited because you don't have certain staff at this point, just having five members of the public who are very knowledgeable to give you the right questions to ask and to highlight for you red lights and yellow lights going forward, I think would be just uh, awesome. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Ms. Lynch. All right, uh, one more comment. Uh, we have Mr. Gorski. Uh, yes, Chris Gorski, 28, Farm Hill. Um, yes, I, I've been commenting on this past and sent an email in previously and sent, sent another email today about this item. Um, I'm excited to see it's evolved. It's come a long way. It seems to have improved from the previous uh, iterations uh, that have been proposed. Um, I, I've been thinking about it all weekend after reading it. You know, this is a great idea. I, I love that we're going to address privacy. Um, however, I'm still speaking out in opposition to this idea. Um, I think to echo kind of what uh, Mr. Bolt said, that these are things that professionals should be doing in most cases. I think looking under uh, Section D2A, uh, the audit, that should be done by people who understand you know, the laws and the regulations of data that the town is necessary and required to collect, possess, store for certain amounts of time. Um, it's probably sensitive PII data, uh, personally identifiable information that we're talking about here um, that would, you know, I would hope we have somebody who is ensuring that we are storing and backing up and keeping that information proper today. Um, if we don't, hi hiring consultants or uh, a, a full-time position to cover that would be a great place to start. I don't think um, asking the many of us in town who work in the information technology sector to volunteer that that time is the is the right mechanism to um, to solve this problem. Um, I'm certainly happy to help and give my advice as when I can, but I, I think a long term solution is not to uh, you know treat this as a as a volunteer gig um, for those of us who have day jobs in in this sector. Um, I, I think item C, uh, moving on to D2 item C, talking about, I, I assume we're talking about scams and privacy practices. Um, and I think it's a big, that's a big item. Th that that one is the one I support this a committee like this moving forward with, informing the town. Uh, I know we've always seen the police blotter and the Kate and the Courier, discussions of people falling for scams. Um, they're more pervasive every day. They take on new forms. And we do see, you know, that's always evolving, always changing. So that would be a great thing that I think there is a, a, a mechanism for volunteer and a committee to support. Um, and then I, item D, I, I don't quite know what we're trying to get at here. Um, we're just kind of throwing out a bunch of jargon, I feel like. We're talking about AI, drones, smart cities, um, in reference to reporting to regional state and the United States government, um, which I, I just don't understand kind of what this is saying. Um, it doesn't seem to kind of make give any clear statement um, and that's kind of my biggest my biggest takeaway from this is we we've seen even what what happens when we hire the wrong professionals um, recently in the evaluation phase, and we only we didn't even assign KRT to do 100% of the evaluation. The tax assessor was um, burdened with a portion of that uh, responsibility as well, and we see how that turned out. Um, I think we need to look at things like this hiring. IT professionals, data professionals, folks who understand uh, the public sector, understand government requirements and regulations, um, and have experience in, in such to give us that advice and, and that guidance, um, and not just rely on, you know, hoping we can get our grandson to help us out, um, hoping that we can get, you know, the town to, to pitch on in and volunteer to do some pretty serious, heavy, um, and honestly, uh, you know, uh, high liability of you know data privacy and security when we're talking about all the records the town possesses and, and information that you would be putting at risk exposing to a committee like this. Um, so I, I hope we can continue to grow this this idea, but in the current state that it's written as tonight, I, I cannot say this is something that we I cannot recommend um, with my years of IT experience to pass this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gorski. Are there any further public comments? Can I can I ask Mr. Gorsk something? Councilor Anderson. I, I have a question for you, Mr. Gorsk, Gorski. Um, would, you, would you be happy with this charge if, if, um, if, it, if we kept under paragraph D, we kept section one and deleted section two? Um, oh, can you hear me again? 
Yes, I can, yes. Okay. Um, can, can you read what is what's what is the guideline of say? I think I, I think for section two it goes into. I don't have it right here in front of me at the exact moment. I just have my notes. Um, I, I think we need a specific charge that details what we would ask of this committee because technology is um, a pretty broad word. Um, I, I think we still want, I, I would still hope that we would give and to the folks who would volunteer their time and, and, and the town council members that would you know, participate in this, the chance to have a focus because um, to say privacy or technology is just, you, you know, what technology? Uh, traffic technology, data technology, payment technology. Um, there's there's tons of technology. Um, I, I think I would still want to see some specific asks like, uh, you know, like the item C of, of you know, talking about private data privacy and maybe, you know, public awareness of, I interpreted that to talk about scams and maybe public safety, but um, again, it's not very clearly defined. So no, I, I, I would want to see maybe some, just take it back to a workshop and maybe some solicit some input from some more folks um, in the town and some more experts. Uh, I, I think that would be great. Cause I, 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 I think we're getting closer. I think we're getting much closer than where this first started a few weeks ago. So I'm, yeah, I'm happy to continue to give input, but I, I don't think on the fly tonight to, scratch it and pass it wouldn't be my suggestion. Are there any further public comments? All right, so to begin the council discussion, is there a motion to approve the charge? Councilor Gillis. I make a motion that town council approves the ad hoc privacy adversary committee charge and refers the appointments process to the appointments committee with recommendations to appoint committee members back to the council. Basically, I do this because I was just looking at what was going up in Holton, Maine, with all the cameras out there. They're, they're spying on people. Thank you. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Councilor Thompson. So, uh, just to recap, answer some of the questions, recap for the public. This item has been on the council goals going back to 2022 and specifically as an ad hoc committee in 2023 and 2024. So it's not the Tim committee by any means. This is coming out of the council. It certainly is in the main interest of mine, privacy law and so forth. So the first misconception here has been that this is not about IT at all. This is about privacy. This is in other communities being done. It's normally civil rights lawyers, human rights lawyers, privacy professionals, it's not IT consultants, uh, Deloitte, KPMG, and all that. This is not IT systems per se. I mean, like everything in life, it touches on IT. But it's about uh, a, giving the citizens uh, a privacy lens on the technology being used for uh, capturing citizen information and how that, more importantly, that information is being used and shared uh, broadly. Now, this is an example of, I think, uh, we've had some citizens saying for years that the town should be more proactive. This would be a, in that category of being proactive uh, to uh, protect the citizens. This has become a public safety issue What's happening to people's uh, information that's being collected in many ways. And there will be a tie-in to, for example, uh, the smart cities programs we're seeing out of Portland. We're part of Greater Portland. That's one example. The, uh, uh, we've heard reference to video cameras. We've had stories recently in Maine, up for whatever reason in Aroostook County, of a school that put in a biometric collection system, uh, and it's as always, this is called uh, a means of efficiency in tracking students' school lunches and so forth. And then in the town of Holton, uh, recently uh, approved a plan to put in surveillance cameras that would be more per person than the New York City. And so the point is uh, here to have a citizen committee that would review such a policy first and make a recommendation to the town council. I mean, there may be good reasons in many cases to have biometric surveillance and so forth. Uh, this is not a committee 
to clear, make clear to the public this is not a committee to promote the use of surveillance and to bring in surveillance. It's meant to be a committee of uh, civil rights, conscious people, privacy experts looking to provide safeguards for the public around their personal information. So just to put that clarification, so the committee, and I know, as you do, there are experts in this town. I'm, I personally know a, a leader in the American Bar Association who lives over here. There are others. If they feel they should need further IT expertise for some reason, they could certainly come back and request that from us, but it just does not require at all having an IT department or staff. We're talking about private citizens who have expertise especially in privacy. So, with Councilor Jordan. Yeah, um, Tim, I just wanna say, and I think I already told you this, you have brought this a long way, and you've done, a, a, I think, a really good job. I think the, um, the challenge that I have is that um, I think that much of what's in here um, is, I won't call it leading edge, but from a just awareness perspective that there are experts out there that I would think we would want to draw on. Uh, and so the fact there's no budget creates a concern for me because if we're going to pull together um, an, an ad hoc committee around these issues, I think that expertise is, is critical uh, because that, it's that expertise that's going to offer, here are, here are our solutions, here's how you might want to address this, here's how, what you might want to think about for two years out, here's what, because I was reading about, um, you know, uh, the cities, and uh, I'm, I'm reading about that, and I say, I can understand why cities are taking this action, but I, I think it's naive to think that, even though we've got extremely intelligent people in this community, that um, there's not a budget associated with it, with some expertise to uh, help uh, lead this, uh, or help guide this, I should say. Um, and, and the other piece is that um, this could be one of the first committees we've had that needs background checks. I mean, think about it. I, I truly believe that you're going to have, um, um, and not that I don't trust our citizens, um, coming on board and getting into some how security is handled, how uh, people's uh, data is handled, all of those kind of things, and you want to make sure that you're not creating exposure through the committee itself. Um, so if, if we looked at and said that this is something that's pretty uh, progressive, and I hate to use that in front of some Republicans, um, this is uh, very progressive that um, we need to really think about how it gets staffed because who would the staff person be? Because we don't have a staff person at this type of expertise. So then, um, and, and I think we need an external resource to help guide us. And then we can kind of develop a model that maybe it can be replicated in other towns. Uh, so I think we think about it um, in those ways. Um, but um, I, I think that without a budget, without some expertise helping to um, guide the process, I think we're being naive about uh, how this would progress. But I'll just go, I'm not opposed as long as we put it in place in a way that uh, we recognize what's needed from a skill set perspective. Well, thank you, Councilor Jordan. The, so other communities, that have been doing this, have just created citizen committees without uh, uh, hiring that I've seen uh, other outside experts. I mean, most of the, the, again, the people who, who are drawn to these committees are already privacy law experts. Mm -hmm.
doesn't mean you have to be a lawyer to be a privacy expert. There are many privacy officers in the area. But uh, you know, I think that we have a community we can, we, we can launch it and see who's attracted to it, who comes out. Uh, we might have a lot of interest for sure. And then they can tell us if, you know, to, whether they need more resources or not at some point. They'll come back to us for recommendations and we can decide at that point. But I think for, to get to that point, we need to launch it and have them looking at it. The, the, there may not be many problems currently in Cape. I don't expect there to be, but, you know, uh, you know this is how we could find out. It's not just about problems, current problems. I, what I see in this, in what you're thinking may have been, is that we need to anticipate what things could occur in order to um, nip them in the bud, so to speak. But sure. that's, sorry, Caitlin. Mm. Councilor Harriman. Um, I was just gonna ask Matt, do we have a idea of what the bare minimum budget for our most not as needy committee has been? Because everybody's needed a budget. Even budgets that we, committees that we thought didn't need any money, need some money. So it would be much better to give them X amount of dollars that Matt's going to advise us on to get them started so that they can come back to us if they need something bigger. But we're, they should have something to start with, right? And then it just makes it so that they can run and then come back when they need to. Does that make sense? Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah. Councilor Herman, great question. I think you're probably looking at 20,000 would be a start. What I thought in the past, uh, and I was talking to Chairman Reiniger about this today, was the, the most current, most recent example we have is Harbors Committee when we had Steve Harding, but he staffed that for the entirety of the term. That was, I think that was roughly $65,000 in that, in that range, but that was, again, uh, we needed engineering assistance on that side, of it, but probably in the 20 range to get you started at this point. We could, you know, it is budget season, so we could get that element of it started as well if there was supplemental needs that the committee you know may have going forward and I just have a question a process question what will this committee be looking at for citizens information right like is this five person committee going to have access to every citizens information or is there going to be a way for citizens to opt out of having their information reviewed like what I mean, in order to look at the global picture, do you have to have access to too much? Like you're shaking your head no, but it's total, like it's not in a ridiculous question. What are they going to be looking at? Like we were just talking about needing to run background checks because they might have, they're gonna have inside knowledge about how things are working inside the town that the normal person doesn't know. Like are they gonna have access to, to things that people might not want them to have access to? Is like, is our privacy committee thus going to actually be violating privacy in their line of doing their work? Yeah, these are important questions to clarify. You know, the, uh, they'd be looking at the policies. They're not looking at the citizen and digital Please. records. So yeah. they're not, the, the word audit has been, has different meanings for IT people versus, uh, the, the experience of these committees has been, the committees would read the reports. That was their kind of audit. They would review the, the existing policies. In some cases, and I imagine even here, it's probably going to be maybe there is no policy. So the recommendation is we should have a policy on X aspect. So it's not at all, uh, you're absolutely right, not getting in and, and looking at the accuracies of individual records and comparing individuals in the assessor database versus you know, general assistance or something like that at all. So it's more high looking at the policies in place. Are they policies that uh, recommendations can be made to improve upon? And are there policies that are absolutely missing that are needed in certain areas? Is that, and that's, that, that's pretty clearly laid out as you go down through, you know, item to item to item, they're reviewing committee charge, um, the staff on data collection technologies, surveillance technologies, data handling policies. I don't see where there's any place where they would be 
they begin in looking at individ individual information. They're going to be reviewing policies, technologies, and making recommendations to us that we're the, going to be the ones that ultimately, like any ad hoc committee, we're the, going to be getting from them advice on, 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 on how we might handle certain things. But I don't see where if there's any place in here that they're going to be reviewing individual uh, so data. Now, while they're, vi while they're visiting over here, probably exchanging recipes, uh, to, to Councillor Herrmann's recommendation, should we add at this point uh, a number? My guess is one of the first steps they're going to do is, our, I, I think our law, the, our council, our town council probably has expertise in this area. We're probably going to lean on, on them a little bit to begin with. So I, my guess is they're going to need some money. So how would we handle, would we need to make a motion to add a $20,000 uh, budget item to to this, or how would we go about that? Uh, maybe the town manager, Mr. Sturgis, address that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councilor Thompson. Uh, I think as you as you are in <clears throat> apologies as you are entering budget season right now, uh, if you establish the committee, we have that uh, basically boards and committees as part of the elements of the budget that goes forward. So. Uh, you can look at that and have that as, you know, it's going to take probably a couple months to get up to speed, do the review process, the appointments process, things along those lines. So as you come right into the next fiscal year, uh, during the budget process, you could establish a budget for that committee, if, if you so establish one, and we could roll that right into the next fiscal year as you start. So you treat this in the next fiscal budget. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have to amend the motion to add funding for it tonight because you could just do it through your budgetary process. Because best case scenario, by the time we advertise this, they're meeting once, maybe twice, before the start of the new fiscal year. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's always a good idea, to not add something at the last minute after we put what we put together. So I, I agree with uh, that. Is there further discussion? Councillor Anderson. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know this topic at all. And so when I'm looking at the charge um, and in light of comments that have been made, I'm wondering if we could have a clause in here that would enable the committee to ha have an avenue to have the charge amended. I guess they'd have to come back to the town council for that. but. You know, I, I'm a little, I wish I were more comfortable with the specifics of the charge. I like the idea. I think it is forward thinking. I think it's something that we should be doing, but I, I'm not, I don't know. Is it possible to enable the committee to come, to give them a pathway to come back and have the charge amended? They can, it already exists. They can come back. Anybody can ask whether or not we grant it. Right. I don't think that... There certainly is precedent to that. Yeah. Okay. There's precedent to that. I think our housing diversity st charge was amended. So after we were in place. So I think there, you definitely can do that. So would uh, Councilors Gillis and Thompson be amenable to that friendly amendment? You are. Okay. What, what's the amendment? Sorry? What's the amendment? Money or the... I'll have... Uh, well, the, I think... I, I don't... I, I want to I wanna back that up for a minute. Because I don't think you're really asking at this point. You're asking, is it possible? You're not asking for what we're proposing uh, to have that as an amendment, right? You're just asking... You were asking a question, is it possible for the charge to be changed? After, right. Well, I, I don't think we need an amendment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I charge it. We're both withdrawing our amendment and our second. All right. So let. All right. So we have a motion and a second to approve. Any further discussion? Well, I'll make an amendment to add twenty thousand dollars into the budget okay. of the motion that's on the table. Okay. Is there a second to that? I'll or, second it. Second. Oh, could, we could just ask the. Our uh, 
if they want to add that or not. No. No, we have to vote on my amendment and then vote on the motion. All right. So, all in favor of the motion to add 20,000. Any opposed? But we don't have to do it in this year's budget. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that might have been the confusion. We want them to have a budget, but we don't have to have it in this year's budget. Abelson and Jordan are opposed to the amendment. All right. So yes. now we're ready to. I have a question. Council Jordan. I'd, I'd still like to know who's going to stop it. Who's the expertise on our. Um, in our town management or wherever, who is going to staff this? I don't think we can just say, oh, somebody will. Who has the expertise to staff this? If I may, Mr. Chair, uh, I have some thoughts on specific staffing that we have in house. Uh, for instance, I was thinking of Officer Estes, our community liaison officer, who does a lot of the cyber crime work right now and has been advise, advising the uh, community on that. Uh, so it may be a combination of different members of the staff that we need to have at different points uh, to help staff it. So I just need to work with staff to, to find who, who gonna have to do that. The minutes side of it's a whole other story. Uh, not all people keep minutes as well as others do. So we wanna make sure that everyone's up to speed when it comes to that point. But I have some thoughts on specific staff members who I'd like to deploy uh, on that. Council Harriman. Does he get to staff this out of the goodness of his heart, being the officer in the town? Or does he punch into the police department on, his, on the clock when he's staffing this meeting? We, we, if, if we were going to go that route, we'd work within the scheduled, scheduled hours for the officer. So then in theory, this committee needs a budget to pay or, or <laughs> we're just paying him to staff it through not having him do other police work. But if he wouldn't be on the, wouldn't be on the road at, at times, we have other folks who are on the road at the, at the same time often as well. So Right, but so then in order to have an appropriate number of people on the road, we're going to bring in other people. No, no. It would, We'd no, I mean, like somebody else would be covering. Coverage. Essentially, we're going to pay him out of the budget to staff this committee. Well, how do we pay other Possibly. staff members when we have staff members that do the planning board? Really, that's what I'm I mean, asking. I mean, yeah. We don't pay them extra to, to I don't be, know. To More staff like the planning when we have board. them, are they all paid by the hour like a police officer? Are they on salary? Is he on salary? Well, so he's going to come anyhow? How does that all work? It would be hourly, like you, you, we would flex the hours to work into that if that was the way that we would go. So, but we're not taking, we wouldn't be taking an officer off the road because we have, you know, patrolmen who are on during that shift. But it would be, we, I still have to work with the chief on that how we, how we would do that. But I think that we do have some bandwidth within there. Uh, so it's just a question of trying to, as this committee gets established, we'll have to figure out how we want to how we want to staff it. It'll. It's a challenge, but it's one I think we can. One I think we can meet. All right. If there's no further discussion, we can take a vote. All in favor of the motion. Any opposed? Okay. So Harriman and Jordan are opposed. So it passes. That was the original motion as amended. Is that correct? correct? Yes. Yes. All right. The next item is to consider scheduling a public hearing for the proposed process submission amendments. Uh, on November 13, 2023, the town council referred to the ordinance committee process submission amendments. At the February 15, 2024 ordinance committee meeting, the committee voted two to zero to forward to the town council. Town Council will consider scheduling a public hearing for April 8. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on this item? There's nobody here. Anyone online? No one Seeing online, none. No, no, no comments online, sir. All right, that ends the comment on that. And I would entertain a motion to 
I guess send this to a public hearing so on moved. April. Do we, ha we don't have public comment? No public comment? Okay. I'll move the motion. I'll second it. All right, so moved by Councillor Jordan, seconded by Councillor Harriman. Anderson. Anderson, oh, I've got to fix the mic. <laughs> All right, any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That motion carries, thank you. Now, we actually get to the big item. <laughs> Referral of the fiscal year 2025 municipal budget to the finance committee. Now, there is an item for public comment. We should probably take it first, or should we wait? You know, before I think. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. So we'll, I guess, take some public comment after the budget is presented. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sturgis. Thank you. I didn't know we were having a budget presentation. That's perfect. There we go. I thought we were just going to kick it. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I, th I thought it would change things uh, up up tonight, as uh, for the past or the prior seven budgets that I presented. I thought it'd be a good opportunity to go with a uh, a brief, albeit a presentation this evening. So we'll start off. This is this year's. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to present to the town council the fiscal year 2025 municipal budget. This year's municipal budget is coming in with a 2.88% increase over fiscal year 2024. Uh, you'll notice that in the general operating budget, it's uh, now 18.6 million, which is up 1.76% from the prior year. And that's an increase over the fiscal year 2024 expenditures. Our general municipal revenues have increased by 9.48% to 9.8 million, and that's an increase over the prior year. Uh, in this year's budget, we are anticipating the use of uh, fund balance as well as carry forwards. Uh, that is $550,000 in fund balance and $300,000 in operational carry forwards. Uh, in the prior year, we used 1.6 million of our fund balance. Uh, this year, we're bringing that back quite a bit with the anticipated goal would be to grow our unassigned fund balance and then use that in future years to start funding our capital needs and establishing more reserve accounts to fund the, our future needs. Ultimately, we're looking at a 2.88% increase to raise $7.9 million in revenue. And that's a $283,000 increase in taxes raised over the prior year. Now, the fiscal year 25 budget has moderate spending increased, focused on capital investments. Our revenue is up, but taxes still need to be raised to cover the additional expense. Our highlighted expense details. Our, our personnel and our salary expense is 35% of the budget. And uh, in this year's budget, we're looking at a 3% increase in compensation comparable to our, our CPI in that range. We're also looking at capital items in this year's expenses and a couple of major ones. Uh, we're looking at drainage improvements to Casino Beach, which has been, uh, is currently at the chronic stage, but we are looking to bring that forward in the current year's budget. And you've seen the presentation we did back uh, late winter on the planning and engineering on that side of it. Uh, we're also, as we saw earlier this evening, looking at town center safety, uh, town center intersection safety improvements that we are looking to bring forward as part of this budget. Although there are no fiscal notes attached to that as, we're, as we have the funding in place. We are looking at the replacement of capital equipment such as police cruisers, radio upgrades, security improvements at Town Hall, the police department and fire department. There is planned investment in Fort Williams Park with uh, bringing back the playground, which was on last year's budget and is part of the master plan for Fort Williams Park. Uh, improvements to the bleachers where the town currently holds its annual high school graduation and uh, needs, they need some needed improvement there as well as repairs to the battery Blair, which is the, the signature battery uh, just below the main parking lot, between the main parking lot or central parking lot and the lighthouse. And there's a considerable amount of refacing and work that needs to take place on that, also in the capital plan. 
Now, uh, these, off these expenses are offset by the use of our fund balance and our carry forward funds, as I noted earlier. On the revenue side, uh, revenues are the sources of funding that are other than property taxes that we have included in this year's. Uh, excise tax revenues are one of our larger revenues that we have uh, this year. Uh, well, they're generated by, uh, I'll get back to that, automobiles, your boats, trailers, snowmobiles all pay excise taxes to the town. Excise taxes are anticipated to be stable. Uh, no anticipated increase in fiscal year 2025, and that is mainly due to continued limit in inventories when it comes to automobiles and uh, trucks and cars. Community services, their programming revenues continue to be strong, and we have found that. Cape Care and Richards Pool consider, continue to perform at or above our anticipated revenues. Pay and display revenues at Fort Williams Park are also estimated to continue at the range of $700,000. So we are looking at, at those to continue to be stable. We're hoping for better weather this summer as well. Uh, last year, June and July really did not help us in the revenue side for parking, but we're hoping for, we have an early spring coming, so we think that will help us on the second half of this year's uh, funds. This year's 2025 fiscal year budget aims to address town council goals. Uh, we're looking to continue to provide reliable public safety services. This year in the fire department EMS budget, there is additional staffing added for greater coverage uh, that are looking to meet community needs where we might find a challenge right now. They're looking to provide public and community services for all ages. That would be funding for community services and the Thomas Memorial Library and the planning that they provide, uh, the programming that they provide for, for all ages. We're looking to invest in the infrastructure. So we're looking at improved safety for pedestrians, autos and bikes in the town center with the intersection improvements. And we're looking also at uh, infrastructure improvement of a significant number with our casino beach stormwater outfall improvement. Additionally, we're investing in communications infrastructure. Uh, such as improvements to the town website, resident engagement services, and a new CETV camera upgrades for our, some of our cameras that are aging out. Uh, we're also looking at improved communications with shared staff with the town of Yarmouth through a, uh, through a uh, memorandum of understanding so we can use staff that neither one of us feel we have the need for a full-time person, but for a person halfway for both, both communities. We have uh, planning and engineering funds in there for renovations and expansion of the town hall. Uh, we have some significant space challenges that we're facing here as well as some aging systems that we're looking to do the P&E for this year to figure out where we're going to be, come up with a cost estimate and give the town a long range plan when it comes to improving this structure. And then finally, we're looking to invest in staffing and that would be the funding of training and professional development for staff as well as continued shared con uh, animal control and harbor master funds, uh, harbor master positions with the city of South Portland and the town of Scarborough. Now uh, our timeline, the budget process, as you are I'm sure fully aware, starts in earnest next week. So March 18th we'll begin the review of the depart departmental budgets. We'll go through the administration and that goes from, from the town manager's office through the t uh, assessing codes, planning, elections, and uh, all the other elements that we have on the administrative side. Uh, public safety will be viewed, reviewed on Monday, so that would be the fire, EMS, and police department budgets. And then Thomas Memorial Library will also be that evening. On Thursday night next week, on March 21st, there will be continued review of the departmental budgets with review of facilities, public works, community services, uh, our capital planning, and our debt review. On April 22nd, after a robust month of review of budgets, the school budget uh, will be presented to the council by the school board. And then uh, there's also an additional date as needed on April 23rd. So if the, if the council and the school board uh, cannot get our work completed by that night, then the 23rd is held as an overflow date. May 6th is the first of, well, is the, is the official public hearing on the town budget. Uh, so that will be uh, anticipated by many, and at that, that, that evening, I think we also do the special accounts that usually get up, approved that evening. And then on May 13th would be the town council vote on the overall town budget. And that would be including the, the school budget for approval that evening. And then finally, the school budget has that final, uh, final leg of their journey, which is uh, the municipal vote on the school budget where the voters get to 
statutorily commanded way on their options. So I want to take this moment as I conclude on this part uh, to thank our finance director, Christy Bradbury. Uh, she and I have been grinding on this, it seems, for the past six weeks intensely uh, to two months to try to get that across the board uh, and ready for your, for your review. And I also want to thank our department heads for coming through with their budgets. Uh, you know, we, we all know that these are challenging times that we all find uh, for community members as well as uh, as well as all folks trying to make ends meet. So we take that responsibility quite to heart. And uh, I want to say that the departments have worked to try to find what they need, but not what they want all the time, if that makes any sense. But we want to make sure that we can provide the best services and the, I'm confident after review of them that we've tried to bring that forward in this year's budget. And I want to thank the council for your continued support and direction as we enter into the council, council's budgetary process. It helps us to know if you can set us a goalpost as we get started, that was really helpful. It helps us every year, and uh, we, we strive, uh, strive to meet those challenges. So I want to thank you for that, and I look forward to going through the next, next couple, three months, which go by awfully quick. So thank you for that. Well, Mr. Sturgis, I want to thank you for this incredible work. You know, there were, we know there are a lot of people in this town who are... Uh, suffering or great anxiety because of um, their job situations, their expenses, trying to make ends meet in this expensive state to live in. And the fact that it's a 2.88% is an incredible achievement. And also, I like the fact how you've tied it to the council goals so that the public can see that you know, that this budget uh, is closely tied to our overall council goals uh, working together. It's, uh, it's, you know, thank you very much for that work and presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Sturgis. Um, I am under the impression that there was a capital need study done. It was updated by Harriman, I believe, and it included, I don't know, 20 or $30 million worth of uh, recommendations for capital improvements. I also uh, understand from meeting with uh, various town uh, leadership that we're looking at uh, improve, we need improvements to the Richards Pool, the entryway to Fort Williams Park, um, the um, fire barn, I call it the fire barn, the fire station. Uh, are those things included in this budget? They are. The, the, the items themselves are, uh, as you get later in the capital, in the capital section towards the, the rear of the, of the document, uh, shows what years those are slated for and their priorities and uh, things along those lines that we have inserted in there. So we do have that. It's that it, it works a lot better when you use your iPad or pull it up electronically because you can zoom in. Right now it's a, it's a multi-colored uh, two charts that are in there, but it goes out 10 years wide uh, where it comes to that. So it does include work that needs to be done as far as boiler replacement, uh, roof replacement, other needs that, that we find across the, towns, the town hall, Fire Department, Police Department, Public Works, Thomas More Library, Community Services, and the pool. Uh, we do have some work slated for this summer when it comes to uh, tile work that needs to be done at the pool. There's also some work on uh, boiler uh, option that we have for heating the pool and, and uh, others of the season. So we've tried to include all of that uh, to, to have that going forward. Now, as uh, the one thing I will say is we are working on a larger document that has all of this uh, comprehensively linked, uh, but. Uh, that's still in production. We're trying to get that to where it needs to be, but uh, we also needed to get a, a budget delivered to the council. That so we have that identified in there, but we'll also tie that all together. As well as the school had some recent work done by Harriman as well uh, to identify a lot of their additional needs that they have. So we're going to try to pull it all to have it together comprehensively. Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Any further comments, questions for Mr. Sturgis? Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, I also want to thank Chair, Finance Chair Thompson as well. Uh, he was checking in with me on a regular basis throughout the process. I think 
uh, sometimes it was a bit of a wellness check to make sure that we, we were doing okay and to find if there was any challenges. And I couldn't have been happier than to call him uh, to let him know where we were at when we got the doc, doc done. Well, and he always made me feel comfortable because, um, and, and not that I, yeah, I've, I've seen him work on the budget. I've seen our department heads work on the budget. So I wasn't as concerned as uh, people may have thought being new at this, but we, he really truly does have a great team. Uh, we've got a great business manager. He's jumped right into the job and, and uh, um, with tremendous background. I mean, we're really lucky to get, uh, get her. But uh, I mean, I think we talked early on about trying to keep below, at or below the CPI, which I think is around 3.2. I mean, I've had conversations with, I mean, we can't tell the school board too much, but I did have conversations with the school to see if they could do the same thing. And I'm, I, I think they really are trying to do something similar um, because we do, have, we do have a lot of things that we're being faced with this year. As our citizens are looking at impacts on the reval and their taxes, we're looking at wanting to have a very positive environment so Penny and I can get a, a uh, referendum approved in November. And these kind of things really do help. Coming in with a 2.88, the school really uh, being very careful with their budget this year, uh, really sends a message to the community. And, and they, they, we understand the impact on the reval for some of our citizens. Some of it's been significant. So anything we can do to show that we're really working to, uh, to uh, uh, be careful with how we spend their tax dollars is appreciated. Thank you for your work. Councillor Thompson, and you will be running a whole bunch of meetings here coming up. So I'll keep you busy on the budget meetings. All right, I think we can turn to our public comment. Well, do we need to do we need to vote on this or to move? I think to we take comment before voting. So uh, the chair recognizes John Volts. This is the sixth time, I think. Uh, I skipped a couple items, Chairman Renegan. Didn't you see me skip a couple items? John Volts, 33 Phillip Road. So um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge some significant progress in the budget and the way it's put together. It's got an org chart in it. It's got a table of contents. I appreciate that. And I would like to also particularly uh, compliment uh, Police Chief Fenton. I thought his section was really well done. Um, I think, uh, as you'll see in my broader comments, I think one of the missing pieces, we've got a lot of detail. And we've got a very high level numbers that fall out at the end. But really what I feel is missing and what I see in most organizations around a budget is tying it not only to your goals, but how are we doing? So an evaluation of your performance and how are we doing? Because that's what leads to reallocation or allocation of your resources. And that narrative, I'm not saying you didn't do it, I'm saying that narrative is absent, so I can't tell. And Chief Fenton's was the closest to that, and that's why I appreciate it. It would be really helpful if personnel is 35% of your budget, that there's a section that talks about personnel and understand where we're at. How are vacancies? What is the turnover? How are we doing relative? Uh, what's the context for that? Because labor markets right now, most places are running above inflation, and we're below. And so and that's the kind of thing, if you do it in the long run, it's going to cause problems. If we're having trouble finding employees, and I don't know, because we don't have the metrics, we don't have the context, being below where other wage rises are is maybe problematic. But I can't tell. Similarly, we hired a part-time communications person shared with Yarmouth. Great. We've had some issues where we haven't had communication up to where we want it to be. But without context, knowing what the job is and the problem we're trying to solve is, I can't tell if we have, you know, when you have water in your basement, did you need to hire a one-gallon-a-day pump or a one-gallon-an-hour pump? Because you haven't told me what were the metrics we decided this was the problem we're trying to solve and this is the magnitude of the solution we're applying? There's no context to know if that's the right number. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying it's not in your budget or your presentation. And it really needs to be because in many cases I feel like, you know, when I look at things where I feel like 
You know, we really, as a town, didn't do as well as we could have, like the revaluation. I don't think there's anyone who looks at the revaluation and says, man, we did a great job. I think we misscoped it, I think we misresourced it, and I think we mis mistracked it. It took way longer, cost a lot more, and we didn't get as much as we expected. So when we look at how we performed, where are those issues addressed in the budget? Where is the issues around we didn't scope the project correctly, we didn't staff it correctly, we didn't keep track of it correctly, how are those addressed in the budget because they don't appear to be, they might be, but there's no narrative that says how did we do on the core things we were trying to do that relate to our town goals. And so I would encourage you to think about not only just saying what we're doing, but evaluate how we're doing and where we're reallocating resources, talk about the size of the issue we're trying to address, and if then we can see, does it look like that's gonna suffice? Did we get the right size pump or not? Um, that's not in the budget. Same thing, technology. Every, technology touches every department. We spend quite a number of dollars, if you add up every little department budget, on technology, on IT stuff. But there seems to be no technology strategy, no technology staffing, so I can't tell what we're doing. I can't tell whether we're, where we're at. I mean, I don't even know if we have an up-to-date list of all the software that's installed on town computers. No idea if we do. Maybe we do. And if we do, where are we going with it? That's the kind of context that will let everyone understand your technology dollars. And it's important. And it's the kind of thing that would roll into, I guarantee you, every single data issue, 98 plus percent of them, in terms of privacy, is about the data that you're keeping. Whether it's video, whether it's computer data, it's going to be touching your IT or oriented systems. And so if you don't have information about how you're doing and how you're managing it, you can't do those things. So those are the things I would expect and hope to see in the budget. And I'd encourage you to think about expanding the narrative so that the number that falls out at the end is not a percentage. What, what I worry is we're only measuring what's easy to measure, not what we should be doing. It's like the policeman who tried to drag the horse over from Schmeffendorfer Street to Oak Street because he could spell Oak Street. But that's not where the accident happened, okay? So we should be saying what are we doing and why, not just what's easy to measure is the net change at the end. That doesn't help me. That, that comes from deciding this is what we're purposefully trying to do and this is what it costs, because other things will be less optimal. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Volz. Can I, can I respond? Oh, sure. John, I think, uh, and I'm not being snarky, just know that I'm not. What you just described as to how we need to expand the narrative and how we need to tell the story around our budget is why we need a communications person, somebody who can really help us explain what is it we're doing, what is it going to get us, and what does it mean to you as a citizen? I, I agree, and if we talked about what that mandate was in our narrative, we'd know. Yeah. Something went into the job description, but again, did we, did we get a one gallon an hour pump or a one gallon a day pump? <laughs> I don't know what the size of the problem is. <laughs> so if you define the problem, you can say, is that gonna be adequate? We don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I get it. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Volz. Would anyone else from the public like to comment on the proposed budget for 2025? Not be online, Mr. Chair. Okay, so seeing none, we'll now return to, there is a draft motion. Uh, I would ask as for someone who would like to make the motion to, yes, Councilor Gillis. I motion that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council refers the proposed town manager's municipal budget for fiscal year 2025, July 1st, 2024, through June 30th, 2025, to the Finance Committee for review. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor Gabrielson. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Sturgis. And your staff, that's great. So far, so good. <laughs> All 
All right, we've now reached the end of the meeting, the last item, citizens to uh, comment on topics that are not on the agenda that pertain to Cape Elizabeth local government. And we'll start with the chair recognized, John Volz. Good evening, John Volz, 33 Phillip Road. So I wanted to make this a separate comment. It's, it's budget related, but it's not on the budget. I've raised it before. I wanted to raise it to the whole town council in a meeting. And you'll see I have a letter to the editor in the Cape Courier this week that talks about how we save and think about long-term planning for infrastructure. And I say that the only infrastructure we sustainably fund currently is the turf field because we have a separate fund because Basically, it costs over $500,000 to replace the turf. You've got to do it every couple of years. So we put aside money every year, town and the school, to put in a fund and so that when we actually have to replace the turf like we did recently, it doesn't really impact the town budget uh, mill rate very much at all. Um, that's a choice. The, if you look at a Yarmouth's budget, they have funds for all kinds of different parts of their critical infrastructure. And I think it would be great if the town along with its goals, identified its critical functions and its critical infrastructure and was careful about how reserved funds for this is critical infrastructure, we save for it every single year so that when we have to renovate or replace it, we know what the replacement cost is, we know how much we've saved for it because we've been monitoring it on an ongoing basis in that fund. We don't currently do that. If you look at our current budget, our depreciation, which is based on a straight line depreciation of book costs from years ago, so we know things cost more now, our depreciation was more than we're investing in our capital assets today. And the depreciation number is, again, from older, cheaper assets. We should be always above that on a long-term basis. We're not. So what I'm suggesting is it's fiscally prudent to start reserving now in this year's budget for the significant infrastructure costs we have coming up, like the schools, like the fire station. We know now it's going to be tens of millions of dollars. Now, we know this. There's no option that is not many millions of dollars. So what we should do is start saving now when we know our car is going to break down. We start putting the money away today so that it, we have stretch it over a longer period of time and impact citizens less over the long haul because we can make smaller shifts. So please consider saving in this year's budget for infrastructure costs we know we're going to have to spend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Volz. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak on an item that's not on the agenda? Anyone online would like to speak? No one online, Mr. Chairman. Okay, seeing none, that section of the agenda is concluded. So now we need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Councilor Harriman, second by Councilor Jordan. All in favor? Any opposed?